Uh, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Alumni, Alumni Weekend and Reunions 2023. <laughs> We're so pleased to have members from every reunion class here with us. But to echo Lindsay's comments, I want to give a special round of applause to the graduates or class of 1973 on your 50th milestone, so one more for that. So this weekend is about connection and celebration, reconnecting with friends, classmates, and professors, and celebrating all you have accomplished since your Northeastern Law graduation. I want to give uh, recognition to our chair of the alumni board, Barry Bisson, has done fabulous work in making those connections with our <laughs> Your law school is proud of you, and we appreciate the many ways our graduates give back as valued donors, volunteers, co-op employers, and importantly, mentors. Thank you to those who served as class reunion committee chairs, yes, and the donors who have given so generously to your law school in honor of your reunion. Because of the hard work of our volunteers and generosity of our donors, it is an honor to announce that this is one of Northeastern Law's best reunion fundraising years to date. Specifically, the 2023 reunion class collectively has raised, so far, so let's keep it coming, $500,000 for scholarships that develop for student public interest, co-op fund, and other programs to advance our social justice mission. I'm deeply grateful for your generosity. <laughs> Thank you to our challenge donors who inspired support. They include an anonymous donor in the class of 1978, David Balto and Sarah Chambers in the class of 1983, Leslie Joseph in the class of 1993, and Jennifer Wilcox in the class of 1998. If you haven't made a gift yet, there's still time to support the class gift and unlock additional funding for our generous challenge donors. I also want to announce a special gift from David Balto, class of 1983, and his wife, Naomi. They created an endowed scholarship for first-generation students. We owe them our gratitude for their partnership in Northeastern Law's commitment to providing access an opportunity for students from all backgrounds. <laughs> Thanks to the generosity of our donors and the incredible work of our students, faculty, and staff, I have good news to share with you this morning. Your law school is thriving. Our incoming JD and Flex JD students this fall boasts the strongest academic profile in the school's history. Now, of course, your class is the best class in the school's history, but they have a median LSAT of 163 and a median GPA of 3.72. And it's a diverse class. 37% identify as people of color, 67% are women, 30% percent identify as members of the LGBTQ community, and 15 percent are first in their family to go to college. So speaking of our Flex JD program, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's a hybrid program, largely online, giving the benefit of a Northeastern JD to students who are in professional paths and would not be able to come to us full time. And again, it really 
stresses our emphasis on reaching different communities, in particular first generation communities, of which disproportionately high numbers are in that Flex JD program. So it's very much an access program. Our students are doing very well on the employment uh, front. Uh, in terms of public interest, our students continue to receive and garner uh, tremendous accolades, but also opportunities. So this past graduating class had one Scadden fellow who's working with the Ed Law Project in Boston, Massachusetts. We have three Equal Justice Works fellows, one with the Sierra Club in Washington, D.C., another with the Legal Council for Health Justice in Chicago, and a third with the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, providing legal services to Asian Pacific Islander patients. We also are doing well in the private uh, sector. Uh, this past summer of 2023, we had a record 64 students obtain summer associate positions. I'm proud to say that for the past four years, 50% of those students, at least, were students of color. So it's a diverse group as well. We also have wonderful news to celebrate about you, our graduates. So let me go through just a few of the honors. Talisha St. Mark, class of 2009, was recently sworn in as U.S. Magistrate Judge for New Hampshire. She was the first African American appointed to the federal bench in the state. She was sworn in by Chief Judge Landa McCafferty, class of 2001, and joined by a number of grads at the celebration, including U.S. Attorney Emily Rice and Joan Fortin, CEO of Bernstein Schur. Professor Margaret Burnham, Margaret. With Margaret, I always have to say legendary. Uh, Margaret Burnham, uh, Mary Bonato, class of 1987, and Joyce Kaufman, class of 1992, were inducted to the Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly inaugural Hall of Fame in September. <laughs> Members of the inaugural class were selected based on their career accomplishments, contributions to the development of law in Massachusetts and to the bar. Governor Moore Healy signed the first tax relief package in Massachusetts in 20 years into law. Yes. <laughs> Working with Senate President Karen Spilka, class of 1980, on this historic $1 billion package, as well as State Representative Natalie Higgins, class of 2014, State Rep Trump Nguyen, class of 2013, State Senator Becca Roush, class of 2004, we basically control Massachusetts, don't you think? <laughs> this is a good thing. This is a good thing. This is a very good thing. We continue to fill the reverberations of class of 1983 graduate Rashi Vad and her legacy. Most recently, when Emory Law School held a conference earlier this month in her honor titled social movements, and the politics of law. The full list of accomplishments at the law school are, food, are far too long for me to cover. Uh, okay, so Miel gave me 915 hard stop, so we'll wrap up. But let me give you a few of those. Uh, Professor Margaret Burnham, again, Margaret, uh, was recently honored with the mass Humanities Governor's Award. She was singled out for, to quote the dedication, dedication to exploring history, illuminating truth, and confronting injustice to protect civil and human rights locally, nationally, and internationally. We recently welcomed seven outstanding faculty members to the law school, some of whom you'll be 
hearing from. This morning, you will have the wonderful opportunity to hear from those colleagues in conversation with. Our law school was once again ranked number one for public interest law and pre-law magazine. The magazine singled us out for our accomplishments in human rights, health law, business law, innovation, and racial justice. And in addition, US News and World Report ranked us number nine in the health law field. So again, wonderful accomplishments by our law school. So weekends and moments like this um, don't occur in a vacuum. They occur with a tremendous amount of hard work. So I want to extend our appreciation to Leslie Sedonis, Neo Marquis, Marissa, Raphael, and Julian Griffin, our wonderful alumni advancement team. So uh, I want to end there. I, I got it, right? Nailed it, right, Neo? At 9.15 exactly, and welcome you to Conversations uh, with and our first duo, Jean Baker in the class of 1973, in conversation with, again, another legendary, Michael Milsner. So, um, welcome back. Thank you. So you came here uh, six years before I did. How did you get here, and why? Well, and what was it like? Okay, those are two separate questions. Let me try. Um, I had graduated college and thought back, and that was in the mid-60s, that I had to have a career in, in some practice that was acceptable for a woman. This was pre-women's liberation. I got a graduate degree in psychology, and then I went into the Peace Corps to do good and also for my then husband to avoid the draft. And we served in India for two and a half years. So I missed a lot of excitement, social unrest in this country. I was gone from mid-67 to the beginning of 70. When we returned to the United States in 1970, women's liberation had happened. And I realized and was you know, thrilled to discover by talking to my old friends and colleagues that I could have any career I wanted. I didn't have to be choosing a pathway that was acceptable to women. And I realized that I had always wanted to be a lawyer when I was a kid, but it had been knocked out of me by years of, you know, So why did you come here and say, hold up? Well, we had moved into the Boston area, because that's where we wanted to live, and I was applying to every college, uh, every law school there was in this area. And then I heard about Northeastern. It had just restarted. Um, I think it had two law school classes. Uh, and I learned about the co-op program. I learned about the progressive bent of the initiators of the, uh, the law school. And I actually went to see then Dean O'Toole. And he was very, he, I don't know if any of you know or remember him. Some of us from our class should. He was very enthusiastic about admitting me as long as I got a certain score on the LSAT. And I was so thrilled with that welcome that I chose Northeastern and dropped every other application I was planning okay. to make. I want to move on to some big things, but tell us for a little bit uh, about what it was like at the school and any particular people who meant a lot to you. Well, one of the, one of the professors who meant a lot to me, we lost recently, Dan mm -hmm. Gevelber. He was my criminal procedure teacher, and um, he just sparked a a very active interest in that field, which went on to be, you know, the foundation for my next 50 years because that's been one of the main um, uh, prominent activities that I've engaged in. We were a very small class. There were 75 of us. Margot Botsford and I were the core of a study group. We had four of us who met and really uh, tried to prepare for all of our classes. Uh, we had, I think, a, a third of our class were women. That was very exciting at that time and seemed very innovative. Forty percent. Forty percent. Oh, well, I was a little off, but 30, 40. This is what would happen in our study groups. <laughs> <laughs> and Margot was usually correcting me. And she, of course, became the 
famous judge and also legendary figure. And I went off into, I never wanted to be a judge because I always wanted to be on one side of the argument and not both. So when you graduated, you went to work for a firm with enormous, big male egos. Harvey <laughs> Silvergate, Bill Homans, Rosenberg. What was that like for a woman at that time? It was a challenge. And um, I felt that I was always on, <clears throat> on my best behavior. I, not, not in terms of politeness, but I always had to assert myself and make sure that I was heard. Now, I did have some very big egos around me, but they were also all very committed to what was still then very new women's liberation. So I, I don't want to accuse any of them of having been sexist. What, what, were the, what was the practice like in that firm? Well, in those, those were several firms. A uh, big, big focus on criminal defense and on really uh, making sure that we were representing people who needed lawyers who would be very, very aggressive on their behalf. Well, speaking about uh, criminal defense and, and big egos, uh, you ended up uh, in the movies uh, because of your role um, in the Von Bulow case with uh, Alan Dershowitz. So tell us a bit ab about that and how it also, uh, how it felt to um, be in the movies but not be in the movies because they didn't use your real name, right? Uh, it, <coughs> um, so Alan Dershowitz was very famous then. Of course, he's very famous now, but he was famous then for gathering large groups of students, most of whom were at Harvard, um, to help him on different cases. And I was already out and practicing, so I was no longer a student. So I was kind of put in charge of running a, a large group of students. And um, I was the one <coughs> by chance was assigned by Alan the role in, on the appeal of Von Bulow's trial, which Alan took up the case on appeal. I was in charge of the Fourth Amendment issue that dealt with the black, the black bag that contained the insulin uh, the, the injectables that had been opened by the police without a warrant. It had been seized under circumstances which permitted a warrant to be uh, afforded and not used. And I handled that part of the case. And I'll tell you an interesting episode. So there was a very big appeal with many, many issues. The Fourth Amendment black bag issue was kind of the simplest, most uh, pristine it didn't involve a lot of facts. It was a little bit boring compared to the other issues, which had to do with lots of factual contests. And um, Von Bulow himself uh, told Alan when he was told that the, that the brief was over long and something had to be cut, Von Bulow recommended to Alan that the black bag issue be cut because it was really boring. And Alan came to me and he said, what do you think of that? I said, I think that would be a big mistake. It is the one small, clean this issue that can be totally decisive in the case. I think you'd be making a huge mistake if you cut it. To his wisdom, he accepted my advice, and that was, in fact, the issue upon which Von Bulow's conviction was reversed. Did the movie tell that story, or? No, the movie. The movie told, um, the movie was kind of an amalgam of my character. I was named Sarah in the movie. But when I went to the uh, preview or premiere, I should say, of the, of the movie, which was in that uh, cinema in Harvard Square, uh, this was obviously a few years. I no longer lived in, in uh, the Boston area, uh, but I attended. And in the row in front of me was the then dean of the Harvard Law School. And the movie had this character, Sarah, who people said at the time, I looked somewhat like, that is very flattering to me. Um, <laughs> at the end of the movie, Sarah was in charge of all the law students, and, uh, but she didn't have my name, and she didn't do exactly what I had done. She was an amalgamation, actually, of me and Susan Estridge, who was another very, well, very now famous uh, graduate of Harvard and has been at uh, University of Southern California, I think, 
for many years. And if, in any event, at the end of the movie, the dean of the Harvard Law School turned around and looked at me. He said, Jeannie, you were great in the movie. Even though my name had been Sarah. So I was recognizable to the people who knew me at the time. <laughs> OK. Well, after this incredible start of a career, you ended up in Vermont. Yeah, and, and with a job that, um, how did you get there? And tell, tell the folks about this job, because it's really unusual to make the move, career move you did. Well, the reason I got there is sitting in the front row. The man who I've been married to for the last 42 years um, had taken, he, he took a position as chair of the neurology department in Vermont. And I had this wonderful law practice in Boston, and I commuted between Boston and Vermont for four years. Oh, and that did get very tiring. And then we, and along in those years, we had two ch children, so I had these infants. And I finally decided I really needed to put my life first and in front of my career. That is, I had to have a whole life and not just a career. And um, Vermont was a very small state, still is, but it was really small then. 500,000 people, there were more cows in Vermont than there were people. Um, and therefore, it was not hard at all to get to meet the, the, the movers and the shakers. And I was offered a job as legal counsel to the governor, who was then the first female governor of Vermont. Do I, am I, oh, that wasn't a sign. I, we're not being told we're out of time yet, I hope. I'll talk faster. <laughs> oh, it was a sign. I saw a sign, and then she put it down. I didn't read it. Five minutes. OK. So I got to, I was offered a job by Governor uh, Madeline Kunin, and I was her legal counsel for four years. And it was a wonderful break from the pressure and the constant um, activity of a criminal defense practice, which is, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, very exhausting and stress producing. Did she listen to you? Well, that's an interesting question. We just, my husband Wally and I just had lunch with her the other day. She's already 90, which is a surprise, and doing wonderfully. And um, she remembers things differently than the way we do. <laughs> um, she remembered wonderful kitchen cabinet meetings early in the morning when we all discussed things. What I remember is she was very, um, she was totally a liberal Democrat. So don't get me wrong when I say this, but she was very autocratic in the way she ran her office. So she didn't always listen, but um, she listened enough, and I had a wonderful experience uh, really influencing state government. And what she talked about a few days ago with me and us is what wonderful social justice changes we were able to make in state government while she was governor. Well, well, I want to talk a little bit about the ACLU in the few minutes we have left. But first, um, as, as an author who is constantly pushing my books, um, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about the, the book you're writing. Well, yes. Um, one book in a lifetime, many others have written many, many. One book, and it's not yet published, uh, about the one murder case that I tried. It's. Um, I had been practicing for 30, 35 years, in, largely in criminal defense, with that four years off for legal counsel. And um, I took on a murder case, which was four years in the run-up to the case itself. And then the trial itself lasted several months. And against all odds, this was a case of, which was considered in the press and by everybody in the community a slam dunk case of spousal murder where the husband was accused of a brutal murder of his wife. And he insisted he was innocent, and there was a lot of evidence against him. And um, over a pe for period of four years in preparation and then during the trial, I was able to pull apart every single uh, aspect of the state's case, from DNA to um, you know, a prostitute who claimed this, to uh, a jailhouse snitch who claimed that my client had uh, confessed, to uh, very apparently damning medical evidence of undigested food in this woman's stomach. Um, I was able to bring in experts and evidence to basically tear apart every one of these um, matters. 
every one of these offenses by my defense, and we won an, an unbelievable not guilty verdict, and it was truly a, a career highlight. And I've written a book that uh, has a chapter about all of these different... Um, Tell them the name. <laughs> anatomy of an acquittal. <laughs> no, it's not published yet, so you certainly cannot find it anywhere except on my computer. <laughs> They're going to kick us out soon, but yeah. start telling us something about your fabulous time with the ACLU on and off. Oh, well, it was on until very late recently when it was off. I have been, except for my four years in, when I was legal counsel, uh, because that I couldn't be on the ACLU board because the ACLU was always suing governors and we couldn't, we couldn't be in both seats at the same time. Uh, I was on a board of the ACLU for almost 50 years with that break. But recently, over the last several years, there's been a, a kind of an ideological uh, schism that has been brewing between the Florida ACLU and National. And of course, I was on the Florida board for more than 30 years. And in fact, I was president of the Florida ACLU for seven years and on its executive Who was committee. Right? Who was wrong? <laughs> well, you know, when you get um, three civil liberties people in the same room, you have five opinions on every subject. <laughs> so who's right and who's wrong? Our Florida affiliate took the position that we should continue to hew to a very strict, nonpartisan, nonpolitical um, commitment to core values of personal liberty. National in recent years, ever since Trump in particular, it became a, kind of a, a, a slide down a slippery slope. Uh, National has been moving in a direction of political activity, supporting candidates, and really emphasizing what National calls the wealth gap. And that's become a central focus of National's approach that they want to reduce the wealth gap. I am totally in favor of reducing the wealth gap. If there was a socialism party in this country that was at all you know, viable, I would vote for it. But that has never been the hat I've worn as a civil libertarian. I always have felt that the strength of the ACLU has been its nonpartisanship, the fact that it has been very principled and it has not engaged in social, uh, economic, um, advocacy. And that's the division that's happening right now. And in Florida, um, <clears throat> National didn't like our position because we didn't like National's position. And therefore, our whole board was <clears throat> removed by National a few months ago. And we are now fighting to get back so that we can, con can continue the debate and not just be on the outside of it. <laughs> well, I told you if we couldn't do it. But, uh, <laughs> we tried. We tried. We got us you got a you got a taste. Okay? Thank you. That was fabulous. Yes, 15 minutes just whets your appetite. That's basically what we're trying to do here. Jean, we're so pleased to have you here. Um, thanks, Mike. We appreciate it. Our next pairing is the Honorable Stuart Rice, class of 1978, who's come from California to be with us today. We're grateful with Professor and Assistant Dean, or is it Associate Dean now? Associate, Associate Dean Hemeth Gundavaram, quickly rising up the ranks. So we look forward to this conversation. We're going to share the mic. Please Welcome back. Thank you. So uh, with this crowd, I can make this reference with my students, they're too um, young, no offense. Um, but uh, there's an episode of Seinfeld um, where there's a conductor of the symphony, and outside of work, he, he makes everyone call him maestro. Um, so first question, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> there are uh, three, you talk, we, when we talked, you talked about three transitions big transitions that you made in your career. Um, let's talk about that first one to come to New Seoul. What made you come to New Seoul? What was your path? Don't we call it now? Yeah. <laughs> well, I grew up here in a suburb, Randolph, Massachusetts. And when I was applying to law school, I was thinking, you know, I don't really want to live in, in a winter climate anymore. 
You can move back now. <laughs> I do have a house on Cape Cod. We just we were just there because I miss the East Coast. And um, so I applied to some law schools in California where I ended up, got into the University of Miami. But when I got into Northeastern, I, I said, uh, this is perfect. And my sister was 13 years younger than I. She was eight, wasn't ready to move away from my family. And so I could come to Northeastern and its philosophy and the progressiveness and also take advantage of co-op to have the opportunity to uh, be in school here and be able to spend three months in the parts of the country that I might want to move to if I decided to leave. So that, that's what I did. And, and, you know, that law firm that offered me the job in Honolulu as a co-op, that was hard to turn down. But I, but I knew I wasn't going to move to Hawaii, so I, my last co-op was with a small firm in Long Beach, California, general practice oriented toward, toward people and uh, their needs. And uh, that was my uh, fourth co-op, and that's where I became an, an associate and, had a look on the map to see where Long Beach, California was and between LA and San Diego on the, on the water. And that was my first big transition. So I was very happy I chose Northeastern be, uh, for the whole, the whole uh, gestalt of the place and also the opportunity to, to uh, explore. I think that the great thing, of, one of the great things about Northeastern is, is, the, is that ability to be able to get the full education but also not be just stuck in the book, you know, analyzing that Supreme Court case. And uh, we all came back to, to, I remember second year, we all came back after our first co-op and we had a lot more to contribute in the classroom because of our real world experiences. Yeah, I see that as well. And, and you know, in the clinics, for example, when someone goes on co-op and they come to the clinic, they're, they're more advanced um, and can do more. So. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the co-ops you did and how um, the transition of your co-ops led to your first job, the sort of second big transition in your career? Yes, well, last night, we, um, my wife and I and my best friend from law school, Artie Malkin, who's here. <laughs> I do have, it isn't really a direct answer to your question, but uh, I saw that uh, Jamie Sabino was on the reunion committee for my class, and, and she and her husband met like the first day of law school and were never apart, practiced law their whole careers together. And, uh, you know, without grades and everything, at our final event when we gave out class awards instead of highest GPA, the big award was the Ethel and Reuben Grismish Class Couple Award. <laughs> and although Jamie and Richard uh, spent every minute together, Artie and I were class couple. <laughs> We, we remain class couples, we remain best friends to, to today. So, uh, my first co-op, I did, I did summer, summer, winter co-op. I was originally in the fall, spring co-op, and then somebody traded with me. I charged them for that trade. No, I, and uh, so, my, so I did my summer co-ops in Boston. So my first co-op was I worked for a state senator, Chet Atkins, who later became a congressman. Uh, helped write a no-fall tort legislation for him. I had no idea what I was doing, really. But he said, and I, don't, I don't think it ever became law, but it was a very interesting experience to be in the legislature, get involved with, with politics. And um, <coughs> the second co-op, which was the opportune winter, to go somewhere I thought I might move to. I wanted to go to D.C. So I got a co-op with the Federal Trade Commission. So I worked for the Federal Trade Commission for one semester in the Consumer Protection Division. And uh, that was a, t <laughs> we're getting so old, Artie, you and I, that uh, computers were being introduced to, to the government, federal government, you know, workstation computers. And even as a kid, I, they gave all the computers, they didn't have enough for everybody, they gave them to all the secretaries who were inept. So they, they're the ones that got the computers. But uh, it was a good experience. I actually, my, one of my supervisors there, uh, was a young lawyer himself, he was probably in his late 20s, later called me, like 25 years later called me because he was interested in, in uh, getting on the bench in Los Angeles, and uh, I helped him to become a commissioner, which is kind of like equivalent to a magistrate judge in the federal, in the federal system. So uh, that was a great opportunity to live in D.C. Uh, but I was, when I left there, I said, you know, it's too much of a government town. Everywhere, you know, I rode the bus to work, everybody... All these young lawyers are talking like they mattered, and we're thousands of us. And uh, so I wasn't sure I wanted to move to D.C. And um, 
The following summer, I worked for the Attorney General here for, I think, Francis X. Pilati. I don't know if anybody remembers him, but he was... You do, Margo. So uh, he, I worked for him. <coughs> Excuse me? Still alive and 100. 100 years old, yes. So I got to go to my first deposition and, and uh, wrote, wrote several memos. It was really great. But then, you know, now I'm third year. And uh, I remember walking home to my house in, in Brookline, where, where I was living with Artie and a few other guys, <laughs> and uh, got off the subway and walked down uh, Coolidge Corner. And it was so cold. So windy, I said, I am definitely doing my last co-op in a warm climate. So um, this little firm in Long Beach, Gottlieb, Gottlieb and Stein, was in the index. You know, we had a little index card box. Those were the co-op jobs in those days. No computer, remember? So um, they had hired someone years ago simply because this guy who ended up becoming a professor at Loyola Law School in, in L.A., he, his family were friends with the Gottliebs. So they were in the index in the, uh, in the index card box, but they'd never hired anyone else, but uh, we, our co-op director called them, and, um, and they, they gave me the opportunity to come out there. So that was my last co-op. There were three partners in their mid-50s, no associates, and they had a, a different law clerk that they didn't like, which is why they hired me. So, and then they offered me a real job, and I called my dad, who was still living in Boston at the time, and I said, Dad, I've been offered a job as a lawyer. He said, that's a great son. And when you get home, you can look for jobs here. And I said, Dad, I, I really want your support. So he called me back the next night and said, I've been thinking about it. I'm really proud of you. And I said, what are you trying to do, get rid of me? So, you know, I was at that, that age, 24 years old. And, and uh, I did it. I, I moved to California, drove cross country, and uh, began my life in, in, uh, with that small firm. So one other thing I could say about that firm so it was great. I, I was, I was um, you know, it was a big swearing-in ceremony in, in uh, Los Angeles. Everybody brought their parents. I didn't realize my parents were supposed to be there. So I went with one of my bosses, and uh, he then, when it was over, he handed me a file and said, you have a court appearance at 1.30. No. So I was, you know, you, you join a big firm, you may never go to court. I was in court my first day of practice and really learned a lot. And unfortunately, my, the, the, Mr. Arthur Gottlieb, the one I was closest with, he had a stroke on the golf course, no less, in his uh, mid-50s. He lived a long life thereafter, but he couldn't really practice. Practicing law requires multitasking. You've got to be able to think six, six things at once. He ended up writing some really nice plays that were produced. He's alone with his typewriter or computer later, uh, but he couldn't practice. So he had to retire, and I was left with the other two who I quickly realized did not get along, and Art was the one who... Um, kept it together. So I left and started my own practice and uh, had a successful practice of uh, four lawyers. Uh, I had a partner and two associates until I went on the bench about 20 years later. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the co-op office. I, I think there's so many people in this room who have been helped over many decades by the amazing co-op office. So um, thanks for mentioning them. Um, and then the last transition, right, from practice to the bench, you said, um, talked about being in court, and then you decided to be in court all the time. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. Well, you know, when I was here, uh, I had an opportunity, second year, to be uh, in a judicial externship in, in the uh, Superior Court here in Suffolk County. And um, that was the first time I'd ever been in a courtroom. Oh, it was so exciting to have that opportunity. And I was supposed to sp spend one month with each of three judges. My first judge was Judge Prince. And he really loved having me around. And he actually inspired me, as I have externs all the time. I, it's been hard for me to have a co-op student because of the nature of three months full-time coming to LA with no money. But uh, I've always had externs, and he's my role model. So I spent my first month with him. He had me at sidebar conferences during jury trials. It was it was so exciting. That's not a co-op. That was while I was here in school to have that opportunity. And they're more common now. I don't think they were as common back then. Then I went to the second judge who um, yelled at me on the second day because I didn't have a tie on. And um, I was sitting in the corner because I had come straight from my parents' house and I knew I just wanted to get as much of this as I could. And uh, so the next day I went back to Judge Prince and I said, can I stay with you? 
So I never went back to judge number two, never met judge number three. Judge Prince came to my Northeastern Law School graduation, and um, that really got me thinking that maybe someday I would like to be a judge. But, you know, as I built my successful law practice, I kind of put the idea in the back of my mind. And then I was hired by, our, by the L.A. Superior Court to be an as-needed juvenile court referee. They don't close the juvenile courts. I was an expert in juvenile delinquency defense, and I got hired uh, to basically it's kind of like equivalent to a substitute teacher. You know, when the, a juvenile judge was going to be out, I'd get a call, sometimes at 6 in the morning, saying, we need you to go here today. Or sometimes I'd get a call and say, can you cover uh, this courtroom for three weeks in May? So, and I got paid for that, but I could still be a practicing attorney, so I was kind of doing both. But now I'm in the judicial world, and uh, there was an opportunity to apply to become a commissioner of the court, and uh, at the same time I applied to be a, a judge under, not everybody here would know the, all the governors of California, but Gray Davis, Gray Davis was the governor of California at the time, although a Democrat, uh, kind of a, a moderate, and the only issue he pulled well on was criminal justice. So he was very careful about uh, who he appointed. Didn't want to appoint any public defenders, God forbid, you know, because that would make him look like he was soft on crime. So I had, I had made it through all the stages with Gray Davis and uh, interviewed with the governor's office. And, you know, you, were, you go from the big pile to the medium pile to the small pile. And then he got recalled, not, be, not for any malfeasance like we see so much of today. He got recalled because the lights went out. And he had no friends, really. Nobody liked him. He had no allies. So he was recalled, and I was still in that small pile. He had six openings left in L.A., and I, by then I was a commissioner, so I was already on the court, and I, I was not one of those six. All six were politically connected to him. He had to find jobs for people on his staff that were going to be out of, out of office. So, that's, uh, so I applied again uh, when the new governor came in, when he finally realized he had the power to appoint judges. I don't think he knew it. When he became the governor, that's the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> became the governor of California when Gray Davis was recalled. He was a Republican, uh, but a moderate Republican. Imagine that, moderate Republican. And um, I, again, went through all the stages, interviewed with his appointment secretary, who had been Pete Wilson's appointment secretary, and he was a very conservative Republican. And, he, you know, the application in California, it's very demanding. It's name, address party affiliation. That's the third question on page one. So, you know, I said Democrat, and he looked at me, and he said, I see you're a Democrat. Now, the governor is going to appoint the best people. He's made that clear. But you are a Democrat. I had my answer ready. I said, well, I think my politics are really not that different from the governor's, but more importantly, I grew up in Massachusetts. This is before uh, Arnold's housekeeper's a uh, child began to look like him. He and Maria Shriver were still very happily married, or at least it seemed that way. And I said, when you grow up in Massachusetts, we are all Kennedy Democrats. And he smiled like, good answer, you know. <laughs> and he appointed me. Um, one last question. Um, you mentioned, uh, we talked about a bunch of things, but um, three, the three things you love most in the world, and um, you know, I know one of those involves um, the last thing you always see um, before you go on the bench. Yes. So three things I love the most. First is, of course, uh, my family. Uh, second would be uh, my career and everything that it's that is meant to me. And the third is is the Red Sox. You know, <laughs> I have a 2004 signed jersey from all the players and managers hanging in my in my chambers. But, um, you know, I shared with you, and I'll share with everybody here today, my wife is here, my wife, Lori, of 34 years. We met as opposing counsel, by the way, in a courthouse, <laughs> and I had to figure out how to ask her out on, without being unethical. <laughs> so it was a burglary case, and uh, I came into the pretrial, and my, uh, I had told my client we should make full restitution before the pretrial. He had stolen money from his employer. He had been fired already. So couldn't really get her attention until I handed her a full restitution letter. Nobody pays restitution until, you know, your criminal defense lawyers, burglary case, one of the conditions of probation is pay restitution. I paid it. We paid, not I. We paid it before the pretrial, and then she looked up at me and noticed me really for the first time. <laughs> Made the deal, asked her out. The rest is, the rest is history. So uh, we got married and uh, had two kids, and our, our son, 
I was studying abroad in England, and at age 21, we got a phone call that he had been in a car accident crossing a street, and we lost him. So we lost him at age 21, and um, something we live with. It's been nine years, and due to our mutual love and our daughter, we've we've uh, we've made it we've made it this far. And it was tough at first; it's still tough, always be tough. But um, so when I was uh, was president of the California Judges Association, statewide organization, I traveled around the state of California, and I even. Um, I met up with David Riemann Schneider from my class, who had recently become a judge in one of the rural counties in California. But anyway, when my term of office was ending, I told you I needed 30 minutes. <laughs> so my term of office was ending. I gave a speech to everybody at the convention. I said, uh, I love this organization, and I love my family. I'd like to do something to combine both. So I started, Lori and I started the Adam Z. Rice Memorial uh, Scholarship Fund, and every year, we funded it originally, and then other judges contributed. We matched it, and it's very successful. And it's administered by the California Judges Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of the California Judges Association. I happen to be the president of the foundation right now. So we started this scholarship. It's a need-based scholarship for, for people that um, want to go to law school or have been accepted to law, they have to have been accepted to law school. Most of them are first generation, as was mentioned earlier. And, um, We've been doing this now for four or five years, and we make the kids do a two-minute video about why they qualify for the needs-based scholarship. We also have a prompt on some legal subject that they discuss. And these kids' stories, the things they've overcome to get to a place where they get themselves into law school, it's so inspiring. And um, for Lori and me, we get so much uh, satisfaction out of, out of seeing Adam's name and also doing something good in his name. And this year, the person that got the biggest scholarship, she said, uh, I'm applying for the Adam Z. Rice Memorial Scholarship. Uh, the, and I have, uh, the, this is my background, which she obviously had a tremendous financial need. And then she said, I knew Adam. She, was, uh, she went to school with Adam. She was three years behind him. They were in plays together. We got goosebumps. We're crying in Lori's study. And we've now met her. We're, we've taken her out to breakfast and... I'm going to mentor her and, and help make sure she, um, she gets every, everything that she could get. She's, she's such a tremendous young woman. She has presidential potential in our view. But we're going, to, we're going to take her under our wing and continue to work with her. So, you know, look, it's, it's a burden that we, we carry. But we, um, we also did some things at Adam's school in his name. We see his name on the, on the main building of his school. And... And we set, set up a scholarship in his name at Berkeley where he went to undergrad and we lost him between his junior and senior year of college. And uh, Lori's crying. It's okay. It's okay, honey. So, um, and to be able to help these young people, it's, you know, which I think, as you had asked me, reflects part of what I took away from, from Northeastern Law School. I feel that these kids would all be great at this school. You know, every one of them. Every one of them, the, the, the disadvantaged backgrounds they come from, they all want to go back to their community and make a difference. And um, we're glad to be able to provide some help to them in that regard, in Adam's name. Um, so, Elise. Um, Thanks for chatting with me today. Um, you know, despite the fact that there were apparently two men named as couple of the year uh, earlier, prior to your tenure, uh, I don't think it's quite the same uh, ethos that's behind the banner that hangs in the student lounge in Doxer Hall today that claims uh, Newsel is the queerest <laughs> law school in the nation. Um, and a little different vibe. Um, so I've heard from many in the Northeastern community um, that when you were here, you were quite instrumental in laying the groundwork um, for the vibrant queer community that we have today. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everyone here. Um, Maybe I should set the stage a little bit because the world, in fact, has changed so much in the last 40 years, it's really hard to imagine. When I came to Newsom, which I don't think is what we called it then, uh, 
it was the bad old days. You had to be completely closeted. I had come, in fact, I was still working as a first year half-time at the National Labor Relations Board, and you just got fired. I mean, you know, the, the government's policy was to root out homosexuals. This was not a passive policy. Right? People were really trying. And so we came here. Everybody was using Monday morning pronouns. You couldn't sort of say the gender of your intimates, nothing. And um, we came here, and it was a very different environment, even in those days. And I think in my class of 83, we had maybe a half dozen um, what we then called gay and lesbian people. I guess we now call queer people. And, um, and so we all knew each other instantly, despite all of the rules and the, the limitations and so forth. We always found each other, no matter where we were. And so we were sitting in our criminal law class, um, John Flynn, I suspect some folks here remember. And John was putting together his book on the criminal law, uh, then known as The Materials. And we had these two gigantic books because they weren't quite edited yet. We were sort of going through all this. And so there was a section on homosexuality. And um, at that point, the most liberal position was that it was a victimless crime, right? Crime, but at least there weren't any victims. And so John was pretty proud of that, and I was pretty pissed. So, <laughs> I just did not think I was a criminal. So um, he was going on, and I got up and challenged the view. And he said, well, if you don't agree, then you teach it. And I said, okay, having no idea how to do this. So I got together with Irvish Evade, who is also my wonderful classmate, and Richard Burns, who has anybody, he's been around forever now, and then a fourth classmate. And we put together what became the first, um, well, we taught gay rights in the criminal law. I mean, it was really the first course or the first piece of a course in um, civil rights for the LGBTQ community. And it, was, it was pretty wild. <laughs> Richard talked a lot about all of the history going back to the Greeks. Irvishi um, was in charge of the kind of, as she was for her whole life. I mean, we all kind of came out early in a sense, you know, sort of intellectually, about really the relationship between politics and law. And my job was to really take apart the offense-defense piece and the constitutional issues. And that's what we did. And so it became something that happened year after year. And then the next co -op, the next um, section decided that they would do, I've forgotten, family law, or tort law, or whatever. And by the time this was all done, we had an entire curriculum for uh, what was then known as a gay rights in the law uh, curriculum. That's amazing. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that. It reminds me, um, your story, it uh, reminds me of a quotation that I, from Justice Ginsburg that I know um, is important to you. Uh, quote, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Um, and so having gotten the pleasure to get to know you a little bit as we were preparing for our conversation, um, it seems you've really sort of lived this edict in many of the roles that you have. Um, so just talk, can you just tell me more sort of about what this quotation from Justice Ginsburg means to you? I do think it's a really great quotation. You know, I often say that careers and lives, I suppose, make a whole lot more sense when you look at them from the back and then you look at them from the front end. Okay, so the front end, you have no idea what you're doing and which way you're going, and then the back end, you think like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And you know, I think what I have discovered over the years, and this was true during my legal career when I was also doing a lot of affordable housing work and, and a lot of nonprofit work, and certainly for the last quarter century as I've been leading Blue Hub Capital and then the work I've done within the LGBTQ community, there are many, many, many perspectives, and you can't ignore them if you really want to get something done. You've really got to figure out the places that you can make common cause. And it doesn't mean sacrificing value. Sometimes you can't reach agreement, and sometimes people are just completely opposed. But the more people you can bring in by understanding their perspectives and so forth, I think the better it is. I spoke last night about the importance of speaking across difference in civil discourse, which is something that's really broken down in our uh, country today, maybe in the world today, and I think it's one of the most important things. We've got to figure out how to be able to find not the things we disagree about, not the oppositional things, but really the places that we can find common cause. Um, thanks, Elise. Can you tell me more sort of about how that finding common cause, um, the, how, you're, how you're applying that in your work with um, Equality Boston? 
Sorry, the Equality Fund of Boston. Sure. So um, I serve on the board of the Boston Foundation, and as part of that, I chair, co-chair this thing that we call the Equality Fund, which is really one of the equity funds at the foundation. So there are funds with respect to the Asian community, the Latin community, the black community, and the LGBTQ community. And um, the thing that I have been really focusing on is people with multiple identities. You know, I, I am a little known fact is I'm kind of a big party thrower. And so um, I have a big women's party at the beginning of December every year. And it's a kind of a funny thing, right? The older women come first because they want to be sure the food is there. And then finally around 10 o'clock, the other communities show up, you know, the black community, the Latin community. And so I am inevitably in my kitchen at 1 o'clock in the morning with all of these folks talking. And the thing I kept hearing was people were so upset they would have to either choose being a lesbian or choose being black or choose being Latin. And they were sick of it. And frankly, I was sick of it. And so part of what we did with the Equality Fund was to say, this has to stop, right? We have to work with the other equity funds and really start thinking about how we make grants that actually serve people's multiple identities. And somebody can't say, oh, well, maybe you're Asian and lesbian. Go see those gay people, right? They're the ones who are going to deal with it. Can't happen anymore. So we went to the Bar Foundation. I went to the Bar Foundation and persuaded them to fund all this. And so we're off and, and running on it, and we'll see where it all goes. But really the idea is to braid our communities together. We, you know, this notion of individual identity in some sense has gotten completely out of hand, right? We cannot be a cohort of ones. We just can't. And we've really got to figure out how to braid things together. And so our work with the Equality Fund is a, is a piece of trying to do that. Um. So uh, thinking about intersecting identities and um, different pathways, um, at least your life growing up in some ways was quite different than the life that you find yourself in today. Um, you grew up in Revere in a family of five. Um, do you ever just take a moment to reflect on that and take it in and can you sort of share that with us? Well, I can try, I guess. Um, I think one of the things that I'm, so I grew up in Revere, which as many people know is a working class community uh, just north of Boston. When I was growing up, it was also, it was, it's always been an immigrant community. Today there are six people from 60 countries there speaking 60 languages. When I was coming through, it was primarily Jewish, which was my community, and Italian and Irish. It was also a mafia community, you know, I mean, Every so often, you'd wake up and discover all your friends' fathers had been arrested as, you know, for running numbers. It was just, you know, it was a very close, connected, supportive kind of place, nonetheless. And then I went off to Wellesley College, which might seem to some folks like a gap, right? But I sort of tried not to notice. And, and what happened, and it was a wonderfully accepting place, a place I continue to be very connected with today. And what I decided at some point along the way was that I wanted to live with a foot in many worlds, that I just was not willing to give up Revere, I wasn't willing to give up Wellesley, and I wasn't willing to live with this kind of giant gap within me. And so I decided that standing at the intersections was really the place I wanted to be as a human. And then I proceeded to build an organization on that basis too, because the organizations we build inevitably reflect ourselves. And so Blue Hub Capital, which I have had the pleasure and honor of leading now for better than 25 years, and actually helped found back in 1985 as a board member, we really have done that. We've taken a set of downtown skills and expertise and combined it with community values and put those things together in order to really build out communities across the country. We focus on helping to build uh, healthy communities where low-income people live and work, which, as you might know, would be everywhere, as, as opposed to um, ghettoizing people in communities that are already poor. And we've been able to do that. We've put out about $2.5 billion, and we've gotten other people to put in another $12 billion. And, you know, I say a billion here and a billion there. Pretty soon it's real, right? So, But it really does come entirely from this idea of um, living with a foot in many worlds and standing at the intersections. Wow. So, um, at least this hard work that you, you talked about, um, you've recently been recognized for it um, when you won the Boston Business Journal Business of Pride Trailblazer Award. And you were also featured in a Portrait of Pride celebration um, on the Boston Times. You're here. Um, so, could you talk about how important it is to celebrate LGBTQ leaders and what it means to you? 
Sure. Well, I can say about portraits of pride, you know, I've always thought of myself as six feet. Never mind, the ruler says something different. And this portrait was eight feet tall. I thought, finally, <laughs> it's the right size. <laughs> it's, um, how to say this? You know, integration, acceptance, um, it means a whole variety of things, right? It can be a quiet thing. It can be a louder thing. But in many respects, it's really about being able to live a full life and having a community that can do that and having everybody be acknowledged for whatever it is they are. So, you know, I look at these things. It's true. There have been a lot of things over the years. But as somebody was saying earlier, none of this happens alone, right? I mean, you really um, you work with a whole group of folks. You work with different communities. And so it's been, an, uh, it's been incredibly fun. And it's been really a, a great honor to be recognized in those ways. And some of that is about what I was saying earlier, which is, you know, you're trying to figure out, I mean, I chaired Mass Equality. I was their first chair when we were trying to bring, I was GLAD's representative, um, trying to bring same-sex marriage into the Commonwealth. It was 10 years before anybody followed us on that. And it really meant, you know, you couldn't just say, oh, the religious people are against it. You had to go out and figure out how to find as many folks from that community to join you. You couldn't say the legislature is against you, right? What you had to do was figure out what arguments really worked and how to speak to people. And it turned out we could, you know, yell on forever about equality. Nobody really cared. What they cared about in the end was love is love, right? That the thing that people could relate to is I have fallen in love with someone and I need to be able to pursue that. And that turned out to be the thing that brought people together. So it's just been a whole lot over the years of both strategizing politically, strategizing legally, and then strategizing in a human way, right? Really remembering that we may have careers as lawyers or judges or business people or whatever it is, but underneath it all, everybody is human. And I, I often say that, you know, we say we make decisions with our heads, but we don't. We make them with our hearts and then our heads follow. And so the importance of speaking to people's hearts as well as their heads, I think is absolutely critical when you're trying to move people from what seem to be um, impenetrable positions. Thank you so much, Elise. Um, I know that as a new faculty member um, here at Northeastern, as a member of, a member of the queer community, that um, I feel very fortunate that our students have alums like you and others that are painted on the hallways um, here at Northeastern um, to have that human uh, you know, embodiment of what it looks like to be an LGBTQ um, leader. And so thank you so much for, for your service to our institution and for all the work that you do. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks. I'm actually going to take the last word here and say there is no point doing this work if there aren't people coming after. So thank you, every single one of you who's made this happen and keep going. 33%, whoever would have imagined. <laughs> I love that. Welcome, Katie. We're so happy to have you at the law school. Elise, you're such a trailblazer. We're super proud of you. Class of 83 really rocks. Um, and other members are building a national LGBTQ museum. Richard Burns is doing that in New York City. He's hoping to honor Urvashi Baid in the museum, which is exciting. So look that up. Our next pairing is Pam Wilmot, class of 88. She's the executive director of Common Cause. Oh, not quite. No. Vice president of state operations. Vice president of state operations. She's been promoted. And our former dean, Jeremy Paul. So welcome both of them. Thank, thank you, Miel, for all you do to make this uh, such a great event. It's such a thrill to listen uh, to all these great uh, people doing uh, the Lord's work out there. And, and you are certainly uh, someone who fits that, uh, uh, that category. Um, so, so in addition to um, uh, the Vice President for State Operations, uh, Pam also is the leader of the uh, National Popular Vote Initiative at, at Common Cause. And before that, she was the Executive Director in, in Massachusetts. Uh, so we're going to talk a good bit about the National Popular Vote. But, but before we do that, um, let me thank you for, for being here. And just tell people a little bit about uh, um, your experience at Northeastern, uh, some things that you remember that helped you in this great career that you've built. 
Um, thanks, Jeremy, and thanks, everyone. Wow, that was really great listening to those conversations, and I'm really looking forward to the next ones. We have quite an impressive group of alumni. Um, so I, um, I came to Northeastern really not wanting to practice law. Uh, I came to Northeastern wanting to be an advocate. Um, I had worked for um, four years in the field already as a lobbyist in Rhode Island. And it was a pretty uh, crazy place at that time. Um, a lot of the things we take for granted now actually hadn't passed. And so um, when I was running the bottle bill campaign, I also passed the first um, actually the fourth state to pass uh, bank float legislation, the second state to pass consumer um, uh, used car lemon law. But with the bottle bill campaign, there was so much cash being transacted. Uh, there were huge lavish parties. There was no campaign finance disclosure. There were, very, there were basically no ethics laws. It was just nuts. Um, and in fact, when I was the advocate for the bottle bill, the head of the um, bottle uh, association, the, the beverage industry, um, actually bribed me three times to resign from my job. The first time they came and they said, um, why don't, uh, we'll give you an undisclosed sum of cash. We'll negotiate if you'll just quit. <laughs> and uh, of course I said, no. Um, the second time, a few, uh, a few months later, they came and they said, um, well, what about if you go on a vacation for a couple of months? We'll send anyone you want anywhere in the world. And uh, I said no. And then the last time they said, okay, you can still support the bottle bill, but you endorse our other bill and we'll pay for your campaign to run for any office that you want to in the future in Rhode Island. Um, if you're on our secretary of state, we'll back you. And, uh, so of course I said no to that, but obviously the, it was very clear, uh, even though we'd been able to make some progress with some pretty landmark legislation, the system was really broken. Um, so I came here to Northeastern to uh, be an advocate, to get additional skills to, uh, to affect state law, which I still feel is like the Goldilocks of political change. It is the place where we have the most opportunity to make changes to help people, but it's also the place of the greatest vulnerability, and we see that across the nation. Um, Northeastern, I was pretty uh, uh, active in a lot of different things. I had co-ops both in big firms and then um, GBLS, uh, as well as the attorney general's office. Um, so I did get a taste of law firm, and I think everybody's sort of pushing that way, but my, my heart was always in the advocacy movement. So I graduated and um, became the executive director of Common Cause in 88. It was my dream job from the very beginning. In fact, it still is. Uh, right now I am in management, and it's actually a little boring. I am currently just came back at 10 o'clock from negotiating union contracts. Um, so, but I'd much rather be on the policy side. So uh, as you all know, two of the last six uh, presidential elections ended up with the person who won the most votes in the country not becoming uh, president of the United States. Uh, many people think the only way to fix that is to have a, a constitutional amendment to uh, amend the Electoral College, but uh, Common Cause and many other people have come up with an alternative. Uh, which is this, well, I'm not sure, you'll, you can describe it better than I can, so I'll let you, let you do that. Uh, and then we can talk about how you think it's going to work, what you're going to say to persuade people. To, it's a good idea. So thank you. So um, one of the campaigns that I have done that I think is the most interesting is the national popular vote, because it is really the intersection between practical politics and constitutional law. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting thing. So um, obviously we can change the way we elect the president through a constitutional amendment, and no other item in our Constitution has had more constitutional amendments filed against it. Uh, it came very close to passing under Nixon. It was not. It was He was a strong supporter. Um, our own Speaker of the House uh, supported it here, Tip O'Neill. 
um, but it did not get the two-thirds needed in the U.S. Senate. But there's another way of effectuating uh, one person, one vote. The candidate with the most uh, votes wins, and that is through the uh, vehicle of an interstate compact. Uh, there are literally a thousand uh, plus con uh, interstate compacts across the country on all sorts of subjects from low-level radioactive waste to transportation to milk to a whole host of different things. So the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is simply this. Each state who passes um, substantially similar legislation, which is pretty close to identical, um, agrees to give their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote in all 50 states as opposed to the winners in their own state. Uh, there are provisions, as there are in all interstate compacts, about when a state could withdraw from this compact, which is basically non-election years. Uh, there's a six-month blackout period. Actually, you get some into the election year, but the critical period is during um, the, the, um, the post-primary um, uh, time during the general election. Um, and uh, we actually have had 16 states pass this interstate compact, including here in Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. So it wouldn't make any sense to do this if to, to give your, your electoral votes away unless you actually effectuated the full change. So the compact doesn't go into effect until a majority of the states representing a majority of the electoral college pass this legislation, 270 electoral votes. We currently have 205, uh, and so are close to three quarters of the way there. Uh, the most recent state to pass it was Minnesota, Massachusetts. I led the campaign here, and they passed it in 2010. Um, we're still hoping for Michigan, which would add another 15 electoral votes. Um, why do we need this? I mean, everyone, it isn't just the candidate with the least votes uh, has won um, uh, all these different times. It isn't just the past 206. It's also... Um, for other times, but it's also because of the way campaigns are run. Most of us, like here in Massachusetts, or even in safe states like Idaho, or it doesn't matter whether you're a big state or a small state, the campaigns and the people that pick the president are in the battleground states, and that's a small number of states. And it also means that there's tremendous incentive in those states to manipulate the vote, because so much is riding on a small number of votes, as opposed to a huge pool of millions of votes nationwide. It's very hard to move millions of votes. It's much easier to affect thousands of votes in a single state. And 2000 election is sort of the poster child of 500 and votes affecting the entire nation on who is elected president. Um, even Thomas Jefferson says this is not the system that we should have picked and that you shouldn't be worshiping um, this document as if it's a holy writ. It is a uh, practical um, document for running a, a nation. And clearly anyone who is outside of the U.S. looks at this and says, why do you have this crazy system? And it is a crazy system. We are closer than ever to passing it. Um, six of the recent... Uh, poll said 65% of population and voters support a national popular vote over the current electoral college system. Um, it does include uh, yeah, a little under, it's like 47% currently in the Republican Party and 85% uh, of Democrats. <coughs> so I, I can understand when, uh, when uh, Nixon was president, the uh, States change their party back and forth more often. We, we don't think of it now, but California was actually a state that went back and forth. Uh, but if I'm a Republican legislator, uh, and I know that every year the Democrats are going to pile up millions of popular votes in California, how are you going to persuade me that this is in my interest that I should do this? Well, the popular vote is actually, um, it, it's true, we... Uh, California has a lot of votes, but so do other places. Um, and the red states 
typically are redder than the, uh, than the Democrat states are blue. Um, if you look at the population, it's pretty evenly divided between uh, rural America and urban America, and uh, ultimately they would have even won uh, the, uh, some of these other elections with just a different campaign. It's a different way of campaigning. It's campaigning about whose ideas are the best and across all nations, all, I'm sorry, all corners of, of the country. Um, we do have a number of supporters, including some surprising ones. Um, uh, Newt Gingrich has been supportive. Um, actually, Donald Trump, before he <laughs> lost, was supportive at one point. He's gone back and forth. Surprise, surprise. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, right now in in Michigan and in Minnesota, we had we had Republican support. The New York Senate was in Republican hands and passed it. Um, they are disadvantaged in these states. Politicians want to be relevant. I mean, that's one of the things that is really the most motivating thing for a politician is we want to be important. And they are not important in political uh, campaigns for president except for in a small number of states. So um, a 50 state campaign would mean that everyone participates uh, and that uh, candidates would go to every corner of the country uh, or at least every state, whether it's them or their surrogates, but yeah, it would be a very different uh, kind of campaign that many want to participate in, including Republicans. That's a good. That's a good pitch. I like that. So, just one, one, one more question about this, and then we'll go on to other things. Uh, so, mechanically, uh, if a particular state looks at, let's say, you know, uh, Florida doesn't like the national popular vote, uh, and the Florida legislature looks at Pennsylvania and says, "You accepted all those mail-in ballots in country." contrary to Pennsylvania law. Um, and we don't think you should have done that. So we're not going to count Pennsylvania's votes uh, in our, or the Florida Secretary of State says that, in our national popular vote calculation. What are the mechanisms to enforce this if it were to pass? Well, um, every state has to provide a certificate of ascertainment under the current statute um, in Congress. And that is what is used to compete to compute the uh, national popular vote winner is the certificate to ascertain. Um, I think what you're asking is, let's say that Florida was in the compact and decided after the fact not to comply with it, what would happen? Is that essentially the question? Yeah. So um, there are a number of Parts of uh, one, if a if a state tries to withdraw or not comply with it, there is uh, the date of selecting the electors is set uh, by Congress per the Constitution, and Congress has set it for the first um, Tuesday of uh, following a Monday in September. I mean in November, and so that um, they can't actually change it under the compact. Um, if a state tries to not comply, there, the actual numbers are imputed. There is uh, a way of going to uh, enforce compacts have been um, held enforceable um, for many different court cases, including on some things that one would think they might have been able to withdraw, but courts have actually enforced these in the past. Um, I think there's obviously going to be litigation around it. Um, but the compact was originally written uh, with a lot of constitutional scholars' help. And uh, I, I think that um, it will be very interesting as we move forward. Um, but I, and I also think that ultimately we will go to a constitutional amendment. Um, it's the way we change uh, uh, the Constitution has been by state action along these lines, not quite in the uh, compact variety, but for example, when we changed the uh, way we elect, we, we select senators, originally state legislatures selected uh, U.S. senators. They were not elected by the people. And there was something called the Oregon Plan, which was essentially um, they elected the senators in Oregon and then the state legislature ratified it. 
and we didn't get a constitutional amendment until a, ma a majority of the U.S. Senate was actually elected, even though the framework was still the same. I think we'll try a national popular vote through the compact, perhaps, or we'll go through litigation, and ultimately we will get a constitutional amendment, <laughs> which would create more stability, but it's also a benefit to having a compact where states could actually leave after an election, not during the blackout period. That is very exciting work. I mean, the, the, the system we're in now is clearly broken. Yeah. Um, so before we go, uh, tell the group some things that you uh, read for fun, and uh, maybe even a TV show or two. Well, I tell you what I really do for fun is I'm a big hiker. I um, am a leader with, a, with the Appalachian Mountain Club, and uh, I lead trips all around the world. Um, I have led two trips up Kilimanjaro, 100-mile um, uh, days, 100-mile uh, days. 100-mile trips in the Alps, hut to hut. Um, I led a horsebacking, horsepacking trip across Mongolia. Recently did uh, two weeks in, um, in uh, Scotland. I also lead trips in uh, New Hampshire. Um, recently, a book I really loved was Demon Copperhead, uh, Barbara King Solver. It was a really tough book, but also uh, very, very inspirational by the end and very revealing, too, about a section of the country that is often maligned. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Um, thank you both. That was fantastic. Um, voting rights, keeping us all on the straight and narrow is so critical right now. Thank you. And I know Jeremy cares deeply about elections and campaigns, and so what a great pairing. Next up, we have Raina Alexander, class of 03. She's with Standpoint. She traveled in. We're thrilled to have her here. Um, she will be interviewed by Hyatt Barat, who is a newer professor here. We're thrilled to have her here. And we look forward to this conversation. Raina, thank you for coming in. Hello. So, Raina, you grew up in Minnesota and ended up here in Boston. Can you share with us why you chose to go to law school at Northeastern? Um, well, my family is uh, mostly from the East Coast. My parents both grew up, grew up on Staten Island, New York, um, and uh, um, almost all our family lives in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. Um, so the plan was to move to the East Coast um, and so I applied to law schools on the East Coast, um, specifically looked at Northeastern because of its domestic and sexual violence programming. Um, and then they gave me the biggest scholarship. So. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So throughout your time at Northeastern, you were really involved with the Domestic Violence Institute. You um, spent both, you, you spent some of your time doing a clinic and also a co-op with the DVI. Can you recall a memorable experience throughout your time in the DBI? Sure. Um, to be fair, I was, uh, I was at Dorchester District Court on 9-11 uh, doing co-ops. So um, there's that. Um, but beyond the fact of that happening, I um, uh, uh, had lots of memorable experiences. Um, one of the ones that I still take with me today and I use as a teaching experience um, when I'm training other lawyers or when I'm talking to even uh, advocacy is um, I learned the very important question of asking your client, tell me what the other side is going to say about you, true or false, um, because I need to know. And that came from, I was representing a domestic violence victim in a protective order at Dorchester, and um, we're up there, and the, it's, it's the hearing, so the other side is there, and all of a sudden he says, she threw boiling hot water on me. And I like froze, I'm like, holy crap. Um, my client, thank goodness, was way more composed than I was. And she said, well, yeah, that's because he was hitting me and backed me up against the stove. And the only thing I had to be able to protect myself was this pot of water. So I threw it on him. 
yeah, good for you. You did. Good for you, right? <laughs> and so, so the judge granted a protective order, but it really um, taught me the importance of asking that question. What is, what is the other side going to say about you? True or false? Because I can manage that situation if I know about it and I won't get caught going, <laughs> um, And so I teach other lawyers who work with domestic and sexual violence victims, and I teach other advocacy when they work with domestic and sexual violence victims. Ask that question so you can prepare. You know, there's no judgment. I, I, I don't care if he's going to say that you are a prostitute and you do drugs 15 times a day. I need to know. And then if it's not true, then I can prepare. Or if it is true, then I can prepare. Thank you. So vicarious trauma is something that many trauma workers have to be mindful of. And you've been working with domestic violence survivors for so long. How do you take care of yourself to be able to continue to do this vital work? Um, so uh, I work really hard to make, take, take care of my hours. I'm a very strong proponent of 40 hours or less a week. But um, one of the things that I learned actually while I was doing DVI, um, uh, uh, at the time um, Lois Cantor was um, leading our classes, and uh, Lois made us all have to create self-care plans. What are you going to do every day? What are you going to do every week? What are you going to do every month? What are you going to do once a quarter? What are you going to do once a year to take care of yourself? <coughs> Um, and so I had created my plan, and um, that you know plan has modified some over the years, but I still try to do a lot of those things. I take my vitamins every day, I work out, I you know take vacations, I do things to help take care of myself. Um, and uh, when I taught, I made my classes also have to create these self-care plans and then report back to me on how they're um, doing them because it's uh, to be able to do it's really important to be able to do this work. Um, it's really important to do the work long term, and the only way to do that is if you take care of yourself. Thank you. So you spent the majority of your professional career at Standpoint. You've been an attorney, an executive director, and director of finance. What makes Standpoint different um, than other domestic violence organizations, both statewide and nationwide? Um, so Standpoint is a really cool organization. I've worked really, I've been there uh, 19 years, um, or coming up on 19 years. Uh, so we are a statewide nonprofit that gives legal advice to domestic and sexual violence victims, um, to their advocates, to their attorneys, and to other folks. Um, and so what makes us really unique is there are places that give legal advice to individuals who are experiencing legal issues. Um, but what makes Standpoint super unique is we do that to the people who help those people. Right, so a domestic violence advocate is having a legal issue and they can give us a call, we give them an answer. Um, and so they call us and they say, hey, Raina, um, you know, in Minnesota, harassment restraining orders for very specific reasons, their fees can be waived. Raina, my clerk, they're, they're refusing to waive the fee even though we meet the statute. What do we do? And then part of my job is to say, okay, well, here's the statute. And then secondly, let me, let me call the state clerk of the office and get them to help fix your problem. Right. Or, Raina, we're having a problem with, um, or, you know, I got a question around this law. Or, and so people just call us and we help them. Um, and there's so very few places that are able to do that because we don't have income guidelines. Just call us and we help you. Um, a lawyer's having a problem, give me a call. I'll help you figure it out. I just, yesterday, um, oh, no, yesterday we were traveling. So on Thursday, talking to an attorney, she's like, I got questions about an extension of an order for protection. Cool, let's talk about it. Um, and so that makes Standpoint so very unique. There, I don't know of other programs that are like that, that not only do we help the individuals who have the legal problems, but we help the helpers help them be able to meet their, their legal issues and make everybody do a better job in working with domestic and sexual violence victims. So when we chatted before this, you shared with me that when you started at Standpoint, you are the only attorney at the organization. You were recently out of law school and brand new to practicing in Minnesota. So never had practiced in Minnesota before. Now that sounds terrifying to a lot of us. Um, but the reality is that many lawyers find themselves in these types of situations. Can you share what advice you might have for new school graduates or junior attorneys that may find <coughs> themselves in similar situations? And it was terrifying. Um, huh, what am I doing? 
Um, and finding out Minnesota law on the fly was also exciting, because by the way, Minnesota law, very different than Massachusetts law. Oh. Boy. Um, so uh, one, I think I have two things. One, you know a lot more than you think you do. Um, especially coming out of Northeastern, you, we end up with such an amazing education and so many amazing opportunities. Just, you're a lawyer, rely on that. You'd be amazed how many things you just think back and you're like, oh yeah, I never thought I was gonna use that like weird piece of thing that I learned in civil procedure. Hey, look, here it is. Um, and so just, you know more than you think you do. Um, trust yourself. Um, and then the second thing is I got very involved uh, and I am kind of an awkward, weird, uh, shy person, but I still forced myself to go to those bar meetings and I was very active in the family law section of the Minnesota State Bar Association. Um, uh, I went to everything that I could figure out how to go and meet other lawyers um, so that I had people to talk to. Um, and then through those experiences, people figured out that also like, I ended up being the, um, you know, one of the experts around domestic and sexual violence. So I got invited to do trainings and, you know, and just got very integrated within that community. Um, but also was able through that to meet various mentors um, who work in domestic violence law. And so trust yourself and get involved. Meet other lawyers, um, especially considering I was not from Minnesota and there aren't a whole lot of us Northeastern grads out there. You should come there. Nice, liberal, great place to be. Um, yeah. So as attorneys, there's many times in our careers where we find our work keeps us up at night. Can you recall a time in your professional career where you represented a survivor and that work kept you up at night and how you overcame that? Yeah, I, um, I actually, on the plane ride out here, found out that um, I uh, won an argument. I was really happy about it. Um, so we had a defense counsel. I was a sexual violence victim. The um, uh, uh, defendant was being charged with first-degree criminal sexual conduct. Um, and uh, defense counsel was asking for a adverse psychological evaluation of the victim, um, which is, like, unheard of. Uh, and offensive, and there were so many things. And so um, that kept me up. I was worried because we didn't have any case law specifically on this. If I lose, what, is, what, kind of, what does this create? What kind of standard are we going to have to deal with? Um, which happened to me a lot. Well, I've, I've done that kind of work a lot within, um, within Standpoint. Um, and so very worried about, you know, what happens. And then after the oral arguments, or after we have uh, argument at hearing, um, afterwards, I'm like, oh my gosh, I should have said this, and I should have said that, and I could have said this. And by the way, he just admitted to third degree criminal sexual conduct because um, you can't have sex with an incompetent person, and you just admitted that you did. Um, so, like, why didn't I make that argument? Um, you know, you just got to trust, you know, I take a melatonin, and you go to sleep, and you get up in the morning, and you go do it again because that's what you have to do. Um, you know, spending time, uh, you know, it, it keeps me up at night, and also I have to remember most of the time, you know, the, eventually the, we, we went out and we'll make it work. I mean, that's what we have to do. So October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and members of our community want to know what they can do to help, what to help survivors. What would be most helpful at this time? All right. So um, on... So, uh, domestic and sexual violence programs mm -hmm. across the country are funded in um, a couple of different ways, but one of the biggest ways is through federal funds. And so we get a, a large chunk of money comes from uh, VOCA, which stands for the Victim of Crime Act, money, Crime Act. And it, there is a federal, so it's a formula fund. It um, by population distributes out to the states, and then the states give that money to domestic and sexual violence programs. Um, that fund is, uh, their money comes from fines and fees from criminal cases. Uh, a recent administration had different opinions about uh, uh, filing criminal charges against corporations, um, which is where the biggest chunks of fines and fees come from, because it's clearly not coming from your individual who commits a uh, federal crime. 
Um, and so it's from big corporations. And since so big corporations for a number of years, there were no criminal actions against them. And therefore, there were no fines and fees. Um, and VOCA is in crisis. Um, and uh, so there is a bill to fix the VOCA shortfall to add not only criminal, but to add civil fines and fees to be able to go into the VOCA fund. Um, however, this bill has been languishing since 2019. Um, and it, the uh, effect is becoming to a crisis situation. Um, our VOCA funds at my organization have dropped by um, $150,000 this year. They are projected to continue to drop dramatically. Um, uh, in Minnesota, our programs are starting to um, lay people off. They are starting to, um, one of our shelters had to uh, close their shelter. Um, we are in crisis. So what you can do right now is you can call your Congress people and tell them that they need to pass the VOCA shortfall bill. It needs to happen now. Um, if we care at all about victims of crime, we have to pass this bill and it needs to happen now. And I don't care that there isn't a Speaker of the House. This is, in my world, way more important. Um, uh, and uh, because we're on the verge of, like, I, I'd hate to, I feel like I'm being really melodramatic, but quite honestly, the movement's on the verge of collapse with all this money. Um, and that's a frightening place to be. I've been doing this work for a really long time. I lived through 08, 09. I know what that all looks like. This is worse. If we can't fix the VOCA shortfall, um, Minnesota's lucky. We get a lot of money from our state. There are mo many states don't get any money from anybody else except the feds. Um, and that could collapse programs across the country. So call your representatives, call your senators, tell them they need to pass that money. Probably here in Massachusetts, uh, you guys do get money from your state. Call your state representatives and your state senators and tell them they also need to fund domestic and sexual violence programming more. Um, or in whatever states y'all might be from, it's really important. We can't, we've been trying to do this work for as low cost as we possibly can, but um, with the cost of uh, wages going up, um, uh, you know, we can't continue to pay domestic violence advocates $15 an hour. That's not viable when they can go and work at McDonald's and make more and not have to deal with secondary trauma. Um, it's, I, I can't emphasize the importance of um, getting the VOCA shortfall uh, bill passed. So please call your representatives and your senators and ask them to do this. Thank you so much. Excellent job. Thank you again, Raina, for traveling in. We're so pleased to have you here today. Next up, we have Dana Sussman. She is with Pregnancy Justice. We're going to hear a little bit about reproductive rights. She's in conversation with our distinguished pr professor, Margaret Burnham, whom we heard a lot about this morning. Really looking forward to this conversation. Dana, thanks for coming in from New York. And we did go slightly out of order per the request of Carl Clare. So Carl and Suno are last. I didn't want you to think I skipped them. No. All right, so please use the microphone. Thank you both. You ready? All right. Welcome, Dana. Welcome, Dana. Yeah. Welcome back to Boston. Um, so, uh, Judge Rice said that his three uh, loves were his family, that's all of us, his career, that's all of us, and the Red Sox, <laughs> from New York, <laughs> what's it going to be? <laughs> Go on. All right, well, I guess the first two are the same. Um, I was a big, Yan I grew up in New York, came to Boston for a long time, stayed here, Right after I graduated, went straight back to New York, um, which felt like home, even though I hadn't lived there for about 10 years. Um, I lived through the Yankees-Red Sox era as a New Yorker in Boston, so that was challenging, and the Patriots and the Giants. Um, but for me, I guess, what is my third love? It's not a sports team, I don't think. Um, you know, my creative outlet was always dance. Um, and even during law school... This is not something I planned on talking about, but I actually taught dance classes my whole time in law school. I remember that. You do? <laughs> um, and that was really 
it was, I taught exercise classes and dance classes, and that was really like what sustained me. It gave me an outlet. I burned CDs. I made playlists. I burned CDs. I watched Janet Jackson videos. I made choreography, and I just used that as like my, you know, put my books down and do something else. So, okay, so you dodged it. <laughs> so um, your, your organization is uh, Pregnancy Justice, and you've recently changed the name of the organization. It used to be Na uh, Ad National Advocacy for okay. Pregnant Women. And so tell us a little bit about the name change. It was uh, just about a year ago. And uh, first of all, what your role in the organization. Tell us a little bit about your role in the organization, the name change, and how it came about and what it says about your new priorities, if, if it does say anything about that. Thank you. Um, and before I go into that, I just want to thank you so much for being willing to do this. It's an honor to sit next to you uh -huh. um, and to be in conversation with you. Um, so National Advocates for Pregnant Women was founded in uh, 2001. Um, to sort of fill a gap in the repro movement. Um, women were being charged with crimes in connection to their pregnancies, um, most often for using substances, whether legal, illegal, um, and being charged with things like child abuse. Because the idea, which is still gaining traction, is that a fetus is a child. So if you are pregnant, you can be a child abuser. Um, if you lose a pregnancy, you can be charged with murder or manslaughter. Um, we're, we're just as busy as we were 20 years ago, maybe more so. Um, and, um, and so the organization was founded to, to meet that need um, that the mainstream repro, reproductive rights and health organizations were not, were not taking those cases on. They were not the most... Um, sympathetic clients. Um, they weren't part of the, the narrative at the time, which is very much focused on abortion rights um, as, as necessary, as needed. Um, and, and yes, last year we, we changed our name, um, which was a conversation I started when I first started at the organization a couple years ago with our founder and executive director. And it does reflect our, um, our philosophy and our um, evolution in understanding gender, gender identity, and the fact that, you know, fights for LGBTQ rights, in particular for trans and gender, um, non-conforming and, and, and non-binary folks, is very similar to the rights, um, the fight for the rights for reproductive rights, health, and justice. It's about bodily autonomy. It's about medical decision making. It's about, um, it's about pushing against this impulse, I think, that's really rooted in imposing traditional gender norms um, and... And so we wanted to make sure that anyone would feel welcome coming to our organization, regardless of whether they are um, trans or non-binary or a woman. Um, yes, uh, Repro affects mostly women, but people of all genders become pregnant. And this is uh, an issue that is bound up in a lot of common um, attacks on us and also just, you know, our legal strategies and our, and our work need to be in, in concert with one another. So that sort of is reflected in our, in our new name. So is yours a, a litigation project? Is it uh, direct services? Is it a policy shop? Exactly how do you go about uh, advocating for pregnancy justice? It's a little bit of all of that. I mean, we are quite small, but we are grounded in criminal defense. So we work with uh, criminal defenders across the country, public defenders, court-appointed counsel, um, to uh, provide robust defense to people who are facing pregnancy-related crimes. Um, the vast majority of people who are charged with these crimes are poor, over 85% or so in our latest research. Um, it crosses racial lines, um, but the the, the most likely indicator of whether you'll be charged with a crime like this is where you live and if you're poor. Um, so we work with criminal defense attorneys. We might uh, be co-counsel. We might never be on the papers, but we are providing resources, expertise, drafting, um, getting experts, providing support in that way. And we're also um, pivoting a little bit more to impact litigation <coughs> as a strategy. We just, um, we've been really focused on a particular county in Alabama, Etowah County, which criminalizes more pregnant people than any other county in the country. Um, at any given moment, there's <coughs> five to 10 pregnant people or postpartum people in their local jail. Um, and because of that, the conditions of that jail are pretty horrific. And so we decided after learning, being, being really deep in that community, 
um, that we needed to make it as shameful and as expensive and as difficult as possible to continue this practice. And so we just filed last week um, a conditions case, a prison conditions case in Etowah County with Southern Poverty Law Center and Sullivan and Cromwell um, on behalf of a client who faced horrific treatment in the jail. Um, and as a pregnant person, she actually had to, she gave birth in the jail. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is an unusual case, I think, for like a, a repro organization, but we felt like it was very much it, within our mission. Um, so we do the criminal defense work, some impact work, and then a lot of policy work as well, both on the federal level and at the state level. And I appreciated the discussion around state legislatures because that is really where it's at. And we can try to make inroads on the local level and the state level um, as best as we can in these targeted places. Do you have an ask of us as the greatest? <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, oh no, am I going to get that question too? Um, I didn't hear the question. Oh, sorry, the question was, do you have an ask of us? Um, as with Raven. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I think that, um, well, I do know right now, if I'm thinking about the crisis that we're in right now, it's support abortion funds. Um, set up a monthly donation, doesn't have to be a lot, to an abortion fund, particularly in a state that is helping people get, or a, or a fund that is helping people get out of a state that has no access to a place, uh, to other places like Southern Illinois. I mean, people are traveling from Texas to Illinois. People are traveling from Florida to, um, to Pennsylvania. I mean, it's like People are traveling all over the country to try and get care. So if I were to make an ask, it, and, and the, the rage giving that happened after Dobbs has, has dried up. Um, and so funds are really, really struggling and they're hitting sh shortfalls. So find a fund, um, doesn't matter which one because they all work together and, and, make, and set a monthly donation. So with respect to Dobbs, can you tell us how your organization has had to pivot after Dobbs and what you see the future looking like five years out post Dobbs? Um, I think a sad truth for us was that our work didn't change all that much because the kind of work that we've been doing has been happening even with the protections of Roe. Um, that in certain places, the highest court in the state has said that a fetus is a child under their criminal laws, which makes um, people vulnerable to these kinds of crimes, whether it's abortion related, uh, other kinds of pregnancy loss, or um, go on to give birth to a healthy baby, you could still be charged with a crime. So we're seeing unfortunately, sort of more of the same. Um, but on the flip side, I think if, if there is a silver lining, it's that people understand that reproductive rights and justice is connected to criminal justice now, that this is a criminal issue, and that people who might not have been motivated around criminal justice reform now see how it impacts uh, people's reproductive rights and health and are now sort of, we're, we're, we're coming together and we're breaking down silos, I think, in ways that are um, that might not have happened if we hadn't hit this moment. So Dana, uh, so there's been a lot of talk about, uh, you know, about the need to build coalitions, and uh, we all know that, and uh, the need to appreciate the ways that intersectionality affects our, our work. Uh, but it's not as easy as it all sounds. Uh, coalitions are hard to build, and for your, for your work, you're, you're looking at people who are working in criminal justice, LGBT rights, uh, women's rights, uh, you, know, uh, you know, poor folks, uh, and, and obviously uh, pregnancy, the, 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 the umbrella, of, under, all under the umbrella of pregnancy justice, drug, drug issues. So how do you, uh, tell us about a challenging moment in your effort to build coalitions um, or among these various um, interests and groups? Yeah, so this is, this is a hard question, but um, I think, so... One thing that, that we decided to do as an organization is engage with prosecutors. And that doesn't sit well with some of our partners. But we decided, we sort of took it as, and I might be misusing the, 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 the frame, but sort of a harm reduction approach. If we could peel off a prosecutor's wield, this is no surprise to anyone in this room, but maybe to other audiences, prosecutors wield an immense amount of power and discretion. If we can convince a prosecutor that charging um, a pregnant person who has a substance use disorder with a crime because they have used 
marijuana, to, you know, or that, that would be substance use. But, you know, if they've used a substance during their pregnancy is not the way to get them to treatment, is not, they're not going to, you know, criminalize to get them to care, then we've achieved something. And that has impacted the, that community. So we have made that decision to speak to prosecutors, engage with prosecutors, educate prosecutors. And some of our coalition partners are not, don't, don't, don't necessarily take that same approach, but we've kind of decided, like, this is, this is what we think is, is the right approach right now. We may change that. We may, we, you know, and we can pivot and we can readjust. Um, and that hasn't been a conflict. It's just been sort of like a conversation that needed to happen where not, not every organization that, that sort of works in our space or in a similar space would, would, would have that same approach. But I think it would, and I think when we navigate those things, it's just picking up the phone <laughs> and calling someone and, and having a heart to heart and, and, and building those relationships so that when you're not always aligned, you can at least talk about why. So back to the law school, Dana. So you finished in 2008, which makes this your 15th reunion. And you got a degree not, here at the, not only here at the law school, but also at Tufts, uh, MPH at Tufts. Mm -hmm. So, and I assume you've leaned on both of those degrees. Um, so what was, tell us something about what you loved about the law school. No. What, tell us something about, what, what did you love about the law school and what didn't you love about the law school <laughs> 15 years back? All right. Well, I'm sort of the stepchild because I started, you know, I would be the class of 07, but because I did a joint degree, I'm 08. So I think one of the, I, I'll start with that. I always felt like I was sort of like, and, and with the co-op program, you're sort of like in and out, in and out, who's, which is my, who's my class, who are my classmates. I was sort of like this mysterious figure. I didn't really know that many people. So I was always kind of, kind of in and out. Um, that's a very minor thing. Um, I was thinking back and seeing some of the people in the room. You know, I took two courses with you. I took Fed Courts and I took Con Law. And, you know, I came to law school only to do reproductive rights. I sent an email the fall of my first year to Wendy Parmet and said, I want to end up at the Center for Reproductive Rights. How do I get there? Um, and I ended up at the Center for Reproductive Rights as a legal fellow, my first job out of law school. Um, and taking Fed courts with you, we applied what, we learned, what I learned in Fed courts in that fellowship because we were talking about what kinds of challenges can we bring? What are the issue preclusion issues, the claim preclusion issues, ret like race judicata was all coming up in these conversations. It was like, oh my God, this is like a fed courts exam. Like I can't. Um, and similarly, I took admin law with Professor Wu and I, the, my advice to anyone is to take admin law. It might not feel like the thing that is drawing you, but it is the thing that has such an impact on how we, like what, just like it, it has so much impact on so many different issues you would never otherwise know. Um, and I've, of course, took a course with Wendy Parmet on, on, on health law. There were so many moments that, or just courses and, and, and interactions with professors that really fueled my, my desire my, and my passion for the work. And um, we didn't have a repro course at the time. So I pulled our discussion of reproductive rights from con law and from um, Martha Davis and um, women's rights lawyering and just pulled these pieces out from health law and, and I got, you know, and I got my co-op at the Center for Reproductive Rights as my last co-op, which I did in strategically because I said, they're going to need me. I'm going to make myself essential. <laughs> and then they, they, they said, you don't even need to apply, take the bar and come back and you'll be a legal fellow. And I was like, I did it. <laughs> so that was my goal. And, and it was because Northeastern, so I think that it's because I ended up here that I was able to get there. That's great. So I, I just want to read something to you and tell me if you agree with this. Your performance was excellent. <laughs> Your paper on Justice Rehnquist's views on federalism, drawing from a range of case law and academic commentary. The paper is comprehensive, informative, and intelligently written. You demonstrate excellent command over the materials and a strong ability to craft legal arguments. <laughs> she find that? That's amazing. Thank you both. Reproductive rights are absolutely essential. And Dana, your work is critical. Thank you, Margaret. That was terrific. And what a great ending.
Um, next up, we have Massachusetts State Representative Trum Nguyen and Professor Margaret Wu. <laughs> Just to start, you know, I love being on the faculty because I'm one of three Margarets. And, and, I, and anytime anybody says, Margaret did this, Margaret did that, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it always works. Um, thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, I have to share that last night I was at a uh, workshop for Asian American diaspora writers. And the writer's prompt was, the change is so subtle that it's imperceptible. And I thought of this event and all of you because it is unbelievable how we got here, right? <laughs> um, so anyways, you are one of our uh, youngest alumni, right? <laughs> I mean, the class. Um, Ten years out and you're already um, in our state legislature of Albro. Yeah, a state rep. Can you tell me what motivated you into politics? Because it's still a rarity for Asian Americans to be in politics. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it's always a pleasure to be here with you, Professor Wu, and so wonderful to see all of you as well as some of our professors. Uh, I, we certainly have to catch up. It's been 10 years. Uh, so I have my group of uh, 2013 up there, and we were hanging out last night. And we still can't believe that it's been 20 years. So I can't, uh, 10 years. So I can't imagine everyone else here who uh, you've come back every five years. But uh, for me, it's been a journey. Uh, I don't think most people realize this. That you know, I never sought out to be in elected office. Uh, this is something that just happened, and I'm very grateful that it happened. And I think that what I learned during my time here at Northeastern set me up for, for that opportunity. And so uh, our last speaker mentioned that there was no reproductive rights class when she was in school, but we had that. And in addition to that, you know, I took um, welfare law, I took um, uh, family law and labor and employment, immigration, all of those things that then led me to become a legal services attorney to help low-income people at Greater Boston Legal Services, <coughs> where I represented uh, immigrants, survivors, uh, low-wage workers, et cetera. And in doing that work, I saw the power of policy and how good policy could really help people and how bad policy or even a lack of policy could really harm them. And what prompted me to run uh, was that, you know, a little bit about, about my background. I came here to the United States when I was five years old as political refugees with my family. My parents worked two to three jobs making minimum wage, and I saw just how um, that impacted them and how if they had had the resources and the help that they needed, we wouldn't have struggled so much growing up. And so um, when I worked in uh, legal services, I was able to work on legislation such as paid family medical leave, an increase in earned income tax credit, and I also got to work on uh, making sure that we prote uh, protect reproductive rights here and protect the rights of LGBTQ people. And unfortunately, at the time, I realized that this current state rep, who was my state rep, wanted to end abortion in this lifetime. He wanted police officers to stop anyone who looks illegal. Uh, among other very problematic uh, uh, positions that he took. And that prompted me to consider running for office. And I remember the day I was uh, at GBLS, I was working on uh, some bill to help low-income workers. And the chairman of uh, Labor and Workforce, he looked at me, he said, isn't Jim Lorenz your rep? And I said, yes. And he looked at me, he said, if you run against him, I will pass every bill. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I, of course he was joking, but that got me thinking that, you know, we can do so much if we put ourselves out there. And mind you, I've never run for office. I've helped out on many campaigns, but I, um, I took that leap of faith and I had to leave my position for seven months unpaid in order to run because we got state funding, that would have been a conflict. And so that was a big decision for me and my family mm -hmm. to figure out, can we afford this? What's that gonna look like? And um, what type of support was I going to be able to get? And I was very fortunate that you know my coworkers and others, and I know some of you here in the room were my early supporters, and that mm -hmm. really made such a huge difference. And really glad to be here to be able to now be 
the, uh, the only Vietnamese American in the legislature, but uh, I, the first, and I don't want to be the last, so I'm working <laughs> to, uh, to change that. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad that you're, uh, you don't want to be the last. So do you have any advice for anybody here who might want to go into politics? I mean, after all, um, actually, I think your district is a very kind of diverse district. It's not primarily Asian American. You know, Michelle Wu won in Boston, but Boston is largely minority based. So can, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So I represent a purple district, and um, we, it's 92, over 92% white, very few Asian Americans, very few people of color. Uh, and I actually didn't grow up in this district. So I immigrated to Lawrence, Massachusetts. I grew up in Methuen, and then I moved here after law school to Andover, and which is where I represent now, Andover, North Andover, Tuxbury, and Boxford. And I think the most important thing, uh, and particularly for the women and the people of color in the room, uh, that we are very hesitant, and we, I feel like there's an added pressure because when you're the first, mm -hmm. you feel like there's just so, everyone's watching you, and you cannot afford to make a mistake. And um, that was what held me back from the beginning. I should have, I, I should have thought about it even sooner than uh, when I thought about it in 2017. And so my advice is to work on other campaigns, see how they do it, and unfortunately, there's no playbook particularly for women and people of color, but you can learn from so many other candidates and see not only what they do well, but what they don't do well, because I think that we can learn a lot from other people's mistakes, and that's why it's important, uh, and your own mistakes, because I've learned a lot from my very first campaign, uh, too. And um, so some advice to get involved is work on other campaigns, take a class. We have amazing classes. I want to give a shout out to Emerge, for instance. They train women, uh, Democratic women, to run for office, and they were instrumental in, um, in uh, my race. Um, and also uh, get good people around you because it is a very lonely place to be a candidate. And so you need people around you to keep you grounded, to remind you of why you ran in the first place, and also to then tell you when you're making mistakes because you don't want to be surrounded by yes people and that is the biggest lesson I learned and I've, I've learned and I continue to have that to this day. I have what is called my kitchen cabinet. These are the people who tell me like, no, 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 Trump, <laughs> that is a bad call. Don't do it. Uh, but you need those people in your life to, to you know, to really uh, give you a dose of reality and I, I strive to continue to learn and so, you know, I'm back at school now trying to still figure this out but, um, it's a journey, and I'm, I'm glad to be on it. So you mentioned that you actually started out working at GBLS. And so can you tell me a little bit about that experience? And, and I, I'm just assuming that it's very different, right, from what you're doing now, first as an advocate and then, uh, then compromising, I, I would think. So can you speak to that? Uh, great question. Very different. Uh, I think that as an advocate, you can go 100% um, into pushing whatever position that you take on any given issue. And that, for me, uh, was very helpful in uh, teaching me how to advocate for an issue, how to build coalition, how to work with others to push an issue forward. But now as a legislator, particularly one who represents a purple district, uh, one who represents a, a district that has um, changed drastically in the last 10 years since the last redistricting. I'm very strategic in how I approach issues and um, listening and negotiation is really most of the battle of trying to figure out a path forward. And some of the skill sets I've learned, like I said, during law school, but this is also why I'm going back to school, to develop my leadership skill, negotiation skill, and trying to um, find win-win situations. Um, that's not always possible, and you know, I have to give a shout out to you. Uh, we were able to partner last year on an article on uh, the hate crimes bill that I, I've been working on, and we had that conversation yeah. about how you know, there are folks who I was surprised that they were not supportive of that, and so how do I deal with you know, people who have been supporters or, um, you know, who've worked with me and where do we, where can we find a compromise to figure out our differences? And that has been a, a great challenge for, um, for me, but this is part of the work. 
Mm-hmm. You know, as a legislator, you have to listen to people. You have to be able to show them that you um, that you are open to. Wow, five minutes. I know. <laughs> I know. She gave me like three more questions. That's what we're yeah, sitting in the room. I'll give you. So you oh, ask the next question. That's all right. I mean, I, I think. Um, and let's take us back to the, the law school, right? Yeah. Since we only have five minutes, five more minutes, tell us your most vivid memory or a vivid memory. <laughs> well, the first one is uh, being in the front row in Margaret Burnham's class <laughs> and, dreading, <laughs> and dreading every moment she's going to cold call. Uh, but the other, uh, the other memory of um, this class was uh, I was in Professor Medwed's class for uh, wrongful convictions. And I remember in the middle of class, someone just ran by and grabbed a student's backpack and ran out the door. And I, I realized, number one, I'm very oblivious. So I didn't even know what was happening until someone like, was halfway out the door. And then the second thing we learned through that uh, experience, he, he set that up to show us just how bad uh, eyewitnesses are. Because we were, it was such a great way for us to really understand. He asked us, you know, what did you see? And we were so wrong. And that was just so eye-opening for me. I mean, I don't practice it. A lot, but that was really such a memorable lesson, and you know, I, I take that to heart now. As I, you know, don't, don't take people's word to, you know, first uh, first words or at, at face value, but to really dig deeper and to really understand. Mm, so I, I see your career spreading out endlessly. How do you see yourself in ten years then? Oh. <laughs> I think everyone's waiting for me to make a big announcement, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, so I uh, I'm very uh, very lucky now. I'm in my third term in the legislature. I am very thrilled and honored to be the highest ranking Asian American woman there, um, and I see myself growing here because there are still so many doors to open. I'm vice chair of steering and. Asian American women have only reached the level of vice chair uh, mm-hmm. myself. And so I want to at least become a chair and move up into uh, other leadership positions. I don't have an exact plan, but my philosophy has always been to be open to opportunities and to meet as many people as possible, learn from as many people as possible, and to see what is out there, which is why um, I'm... Um, I'm keeping my options open. <laughs> oh, she's already in politics. Yes. <laughs> That's great. So one final question. So it originally was going to be like, you know, what do you do in your free time, this and that. But in fact, what is your secret passion? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, my secret passion is singing. Some of you actually didn't realize this, but during law school, on the weekends, I occasionally sang as a Vietnamese pop singer. <laughs> yes, I had posters everywhere. Oh, I'm not doing that. Yeah, no. <laughs> My voice is gone. No, 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 no. But no, you have to, this is going to be a much longer conversation, but yes, that's I love to sing during my karaoke is my thing, and that's how I get my, uh, you know, my outlet. Well, we are definitely going to have to give you back. Man, you set that up perfectly for a song. I was hoping. So last but not least, by far, we have a terrific conversation with Sunu Chandy, class of 1998. She's now Conversation with distinguished, distinguished Professor Carl Clare, our labor guru. Here we go, guys. You know, it's wonderful to see you. It's been several years, uh, uh, and uh, we're we're thrilled to have you back with us. Uh, so please uh, start off with an overview of your le- legal career um, since leaving Newsil. Uh I hear you recently left the National Women's Law Center and took a new job at Democracy Forward. So bring us up to, a- up to date. You have to share the mic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, first of all, everyone just stretch. Like, make sure that there's a lot of oxygen going into your mind. I want you to be very, like clear, even though we've been in this room for a couple hours, 
because we all agreed that I get to ask Carla the last question. Because <laughs> um, when Miel asked me to do this, I thought I was interviewing Carl. And I was like, there's so much happening right now in the labor movement. I can't wait. And then I heard he was interviewing me. <laughs> so, but we still get to turn the tables at the end. I have to start also with thanking Miel for Women in Law because the last time I was in this room, two times ago, I was on a panel with, with Irva Shivad, who's been mentioned a few times. And then the last time I was in this room was for her memorial. So I am really feeling her spirit, and I know her name has been named a few times already today. So thank you all for um, letting me say that. So I graduated in 98, and I, I also have a co-op success story, which is I started my own co-op as a, at a labor and employment law firm, Gladstein Reef and McGinnis in New York City which grew out of other co-ops where I asked them, who should I work with if I want to do labor law here? And they said, work with Amy, Amy Gladstein. Gladstein, Reef, and McGinnis had never hired someone right out of law school. So as Dana said, like, we just perform well because we've had work experience. And so they said, wow, we've never had an intern do this. And so they hired me. And so I did get my first job out of my last co-op, which was incredible. And then another Northeastern story is our classmate, Lily Palacios, who's at... Tufts now was at EEOC in Boston, and she told me about the EEOC job in New York. And so I shifted there, and I was there for 15 years. I have to give a shout out to everyone who works on DV and all, everyone who works in defending um, people who have allegations against them, because I could never do that work because I, it, it's so passionate and so much is at stake. People's lives are at stake. So thank you to ACLU, thank you to Dana and to everyone who does that work. I found, for me, I like to sue corporations to get them to pay money to, <laughs> for people who suffered discrimination. Like I, I could sleep at night better with those stakes. And so that's the work I did for 15 years and I could have done that my whole career, but I was recruited into another position with, and also, I've had Northeastern co-op students at all of these jobs. I've, I've always had my employers become a Northeastern. I, I told Democracy Forward, where I've only been for three weeks, like, get the form, start filling it out so I can say I'm in process to make Democracy Forward also a co-op employer. So that's in the works. Um, but going back, I had a co-op student who helped me do a LinkedIn page to find a claimant for an EEOC case. Through that LinkedIn page, I was recruited to be general counsel at the DC Office of Human Rights. And that's why my family moved to DC nine years ago. And after that, I was able to join HHS, Health and Human Services, as deputy director of civil rights. After the last administration came in, I couldn't stay in that job. I was SES, so my direct boss was a political appointee, Roger Severino, who was trying to dismantle rights of LGBTQ people with health care, reproductive rights, and so on. And so I was fortunate to be able to join the National Women's Law Center as legal director. That's what I did for six years. It was an incredible job working on all different areas of gender justice and LGBTQ rights also as part of that. And so I just left a couple months ago to join Democracy Forward. And I know that I'll be working with the team that's fighting back against the attacks on DEI in workplaces following the affirmative action decision. Um, given my employment law background, I'll be able to support that team. But I'm a senior advisor working with Sky Perryman, our president, so I'll get to work on a host of issues. And basically, they sue the bad guys. I mean, it's they, across issues, across identities, across areas, and across the country. So I'm really excited to be there. So, Sunu, you, you told us uh, how uh, co-op and so on made connections which launched your career, but thinking back about the experience at, at Newsel itself, what was the effect uh, of the law school uh, on, on your growth as a person and a professional? Okay, so Patricia Williams, who's I think still here now as a professor, is that right? Okay, so when she was um, wrote a book, Alchemy of Race and Rights, that I saw in the library in 1992, when I was a college counselor in Richland Center, Wisconsin, and I had one day off a week, and I rode my bike to the town and I saw that book. And I wrote her a handwritten letter, and she wrote back, and I said, like, should I go to law school? Where should I go? How does this work? And she said, you should go to a place that will open the most doors or go to a place where you feel the most comfortable. And after coming here, I thought this was the best 
option for me, given the other students, given the alum, and given the public interest focus. And so it definitely turned out to be that way. I made so many lifelong friends. I'm looking at Jody Ratner from my first like TA group and <laughs> Jennifer and Amita and so many people who uh, we've kept in touch, even if it's sporadically, and we are cheering each other on and support each other. And like I said, I know the, I know the power of a Northeastern co-op student. Mm -hmm. And so I felt very comfortable telling my colleagues in any of my jobs, take the Northeastern person, you will not regret it. Because just the work experience will, um, especially if it's not a, you know, the first co-op, just having any work experience just teaches you lawyering, as we all know, um, so much more than the classroom. So uh, tell us a little bit about your life outside the legal and professional world, uh, your, your personal life, your activism, and particularly in LGBTQ plus spaces. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when I was in Boston, a group was started called Masala, Massachusetts Area South Asian LGBTQ Association, right when I got here. And a friend was like, do you want to be part of this? I said, do I? This is like made for me. So that was awesome. And then when I went to New York City, I was active with Salga, the South Asian LGBT group there, and sort of like that in DC with Kush. And that was really important to me, both for creating facilitated um, spaces for people as they're coming out and just being a mentor and being a source of support. It was also important to me because I was a federal litigator and under our Title VII or other federal laws, we didn't have clear protections for LGBTQ people. And so I had a serious ethical issue with that. Like here I am all day long working on a law that doesn't even protect me. And so have, doing outside advocacy and uh, support for my community was really important. Um, also, a lot of that ground, groundwork for now what we have is the Bostock decision was done at EEOC and I was able to do you know, national webinars with other presenters to teach the investigators what the building blocks are for those arguments, which turned into administrative decisions from EEOC, which then court cases built on that ultimately led to the Bostock decision where now Title VII <laughs> workplace protections federally across the country protect LGBTQ workers if there's 15 or more employees. And that decision has been helping with some state laws that have greater protections, like I think Florida, where it was like maybe four or more, that now is following the federal law because the precedent says that the sex is defined the same way. So there's been a lot of wonderful changes, others have said in the law. Obviously there's a lot of attacks now too. Uh, I'll close with saying I'm on the board of the Transgender Law Center and that was really important because as a uh, <coughs> sort of more mainstream women's rights group, National Women's Law Center, we were continually called on to rebut these arguments that if you have rights for LGBTQ people, it takes away somehow rights for women or cisgender women, because that's not the case. And so there was a lot of work we did, amicus briefs to the Supreme Court, other even at circuit level, to say this is not true, not in our name, this is all part of the same fight of control, as Dana said, in terms of controlling people based on a host of areas. And so it was important for me, being at the National Women's Law Center, to also be a visible presence on the Transgender Law Center board. And so that work has also continued. Uh, now, we know the personal is political and the political is personal, but how about a little bit on the so-called personal life? Yes, I um, have a spouse, Erica Simmons, who works in the green job space. Uh, for 15 years, we took care of her grandmother because her mom had passed away many years ago and her grandmother passed away last February. We also have a daughter um, who's in eighth grade. She's going to be 14 in a week. And so definitely have a full life. And sort of when we look at rights for caregivers or, or rights for just different family structures or disability rights, because Granny walked with a walker. And we actually brought a case against Hilton because they gave away our ADA room two years in a row on the holidays, which we resolved and they did training and changes, you know, or finding housing that's accessible for people with disabilities has been a challenge for many, many years. And so through that, having great granny as part of our, our nuclear family, I've learned so much about uh, being a disability rights activist too. Uh, astonishingly, in addition to all of that, 
Uh, Sunu has recently published a book of poetry, and I'm going to invite you to read a, a poem for us. Okay, hold up the book, my, my dear comrades. And copies are available. I have five copies left, so you can get a signed one afterwards. I'm happy to do that. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I, I wrote poetry in college and led a women of color writing group um, as part one of my senior projects. And then continued to do workshops throughout my time in New York City. And then some, a friend of a friend said, why don't you get an MFA? I'm like, why would I do that? But then it sort of put a bug in my head. It became more and more interesting to me. And I understood I could do it part time. And so I did it in three years. I took two classes at a time and I loved it. I ended up going to Queens College CUNY because I wasn't going to take out that amount of debt again. So I didn't go to New School or Rutgers, even though they had great programs too. I finished the program about 10 years ago and put my manuscript on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then during the pandemic, um, Miel gets credit for this too because there was Tracy Lukes, yeah, is a sort of a coach person who is, um, did one of those sessions and she said, anybody who wants a free 30 minute session afterwards, sign up, which I love that kind of thing, signed up. And then she said, well, what's, what's you working on? I said, well, there's this poetry thing, blah, blah, blah. She said, well, why aren't you doing it? I said, I, I don't know, I'm scared, I don't know, I don't know if it'll be good. And she said, okay, so send, send me a vision board in one week about why you would want to publish your poetry. And I said, it was just small, just 12 inches by 12 inches. I emailed it to her. And then I signed up for this online virtual community, Unicorn Authors Club, that provided support, community building, coaching, and mostly just got me out of my fear and ambivalence. And so my book in talks about affirmative action, becoming a parent, LGBTQ identity, civil rights, workers' rights, a range of things. And... Um, I'm going to read, I'm, I'm cutting short my answers because I'm going to read two short poems. And one of them is about my peace and global studies semester in Jerusalem. And just this morning, and actually all week, I've been getting messages from friends saying, Do you can you connect somebody with an employment lawyer because people are getting threatened and fired for mentioning Palestine. And we have to be able to talk about violence that's done to Jewish people, anti-Semitism, and also the rights of Palestinian people. And so I'm gonna read one poem that's about that semester, and then I'm gonna read another shorter poem. Oh, you should have one you. No, I've got it, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jerusalem. <clears throat> Morning mint tea with Mohammed, and then shopping in the market. Today for ceramic blue tiles and an olive wood nativity set. I weave between tourists on the Holy Land, Jesus, Way of the Cross tours. Someone was stabbed right here yesterday. Cries were heard two streets over at our Gloria Hotel. I touch the stone where Jesus had once lay, light a candle, and pay my donation. I place yet another prayer in the wailing wall, this time that no one else be sexually assaulted ever again, inshallah. Our classmate's body was grabbed the first night. She still shivers when she talks about that evening. Last week's prayers, the classmate who vomits at the hotel after dinner every night. We tour refugee camps with starving children and then harvest lush green olives. After floating in the Dead Sea, we create our own mud mask facials. My handsome friend organizes his own belated bar mitzvah. After a day picking kiwis, we gather in the kibbutz basement bomb shelter. Katusha rockets are coming in tonight from southern Lebanon. The skinniest white girl on the program tells me daily how fat she is. We are roommates and I am twice her size. The Mexican-American girl keeps being mistreated, mistaken for Arab. She buys herself flowers to distract. Mid-semester break, we escape to Cairo and Alexandria, to pyramids and beaches. Black, back in Jerusalem, we stood vigil with the women in black, meet gay activists, attend a Palestinian meeting, location undisclosed, just show up here and they'll take you. Later that evening, dinner with the Indian Jewish Women's Organization. The next day, riding through Gaza, we get caught between Palestinian children with rocks and Israeli tanks. 
Crouched between bus seats, we witnessed defiant Palestinian women run towards Israeli tanks, anger and stones their only weapons. Less than an hour later, we are lounging, drinking with the UN soldiers at the beach club of Gaza. Rested up, we happily return to Jerusalem. <coughs> we had missed our favorite falafel stand, the bakery with the best challah bread, and the Jerusalem dance club where the entryway sign read, no dogs and no Arabs. So this obviously was from a long time ago, and it was you know, during that college experience where you sort of take in all of this. You know, we studied with Palestinian professors and, and Jewish professors, and it was a very intense experience, as you can imagine. And so having even just lived there for a short time, I have always felt like I had some responsibility to, to be an advocate for the rights of all the people there, which obviously now with everything that's happened is, is really at the forefront. The last thing I'll say about that is um, when the book came out, I, I only got one book review, but it was a big one from the Poetry Foundation. And I was very excited about that, and it was a good review, and it makes me very happy. One thing that was intriguing about it was the first line of the review says, Chandy is really all about marginalized groups, blah, 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 okay. And then it says, particularly Palestinians, which is fascinating because any group that mentions Palestinians mentions lots of other groups. I took from that then and now that if you mention Palestine, you will be branded in that way, which is unfair and just inaccurate and conflated with supporting violence. So I just urge us all to mention Palestine and to just educate people that that is different than Hamas, that's different than supporting violence. And that is really important because people are already being targeted when they do that. So I wanted to say that. And then the last thing I'll do is read a much shorter poem and this poem has a range because my friend read it, my friend who's the Episcopal priest in um, Atlanta read it for an Easter service, and a friend who is a college um, classmate read it in the Oregon Senate where she's a senator. So see what you think. It, 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 it's one of these poems that's a metaphor, so see what you think the underlying meaning is. Teaching my daughter to recap the toddler toothpaste. Don't push hard, don't push hard, don't push so hard, no need to press it so, just place it gently on top, let it settle into its place, only then, gently twist, not that way, <laughs> not that way, the other way, <laughs> try one way. Try one way. If it doesn't work, then stop. Then stop. <laughs> stop completely. Then try another way. Trust me. Trust me. You will know when it is time to stop turning. Carl, I'm going to ask you your question. How much time do we have? A few minutes? I'm going to ask Carl. Oh, yes, people are crying. The ultimate, the ultimate, what the poet wants. What do you think that poem means, Carl? And then, what's happening with the <laughs> I've been teaching labor law at Northeastern for 47 years. Ted Lieberman was in the classroom my first day as a law professor. He went on to, no, through no fault of my own, he went on to a distinguished career as a, a labor lawyer and litigator. There have been ups and downs, highs and lows for the labor movement over, over that time. This is a thrilling time to be teaching labor law. You, you know the headlines, uh, soon you mentioned uh, them, Amazon, uh, uh, Starbucks, the United Auto Workers, uh, the Hollywood strikes, you've seen that. But there's also, in little nooks and crannies of places, uh, something new is happening. Uh, a month ago, on a Thursday evening, the graduate student workers at Northeastern, uh, 
the uh, teaching assistants and research assistants uh, voted in the National Labor Relations Board election uh, to be represented by the United Auto Workers. Uh, the university shamefully resisted that uh, election for eight years, and the students persisted. Uh, the university uh, used every weakness in the National Labor Relations Act to hold off the election. Um, and now they are still refusing to accept the, the uh, verdict of the ballot. There were over 1,200 ballots cast. 94% of the student uh, workers uh, have voted yes. Uh, so if you want to help, write to the president of the university and tell, tell him that if Northeastern is going to be a 21st century university as it, it hopes to be and aspires to be, it should stop using past century union busting tactics. Uh, uh, we should cut it short. It's been a, a long morning, but I, I just want to say that what's very special about this uh, moment for me. We've, in in recent decades, the progressive movements have emphasized uh, uh, individual rights, civil rights struggles, incredibly important, and the the richness of intersectionality has has uh, uh, as soon as career demonstrates has. Uh, 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 filled those struggles. We've also had uh, sporadically uh, mass mobilization, and notably in the in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. What's coming back now in a, in a new way is the idea of collective power and the idea of uh, economic redistribution. Uh, and it's it's not collective power at the expense of the individual. It's it's collective power as an experience that individuals can 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 have bring solidarity into their lives, and this makes us, uh, offers the possibility to make us better people. Uh, and and the, the current generation is rediscovering that and, and doing, I think, a better job than my generation did and my parents' generation did. So uh, it's, it's, it's thrilling to watch. Thank you for asking. Thank you for letting me turn the tables. And I will say, you know, having just left the National Women's Law Center, I was really proud that they accepted the union right away and talk about it on their website. And as with many nonprofits, they are becoming a better organization because of the union. I was not on the negotiating team for management, but I was on the sort of management committee that helped advise the negotiating. And, you know, we were like, do the right thing, you know, just in terms of all the kinds of leave and the other things that you can get in a contract that, you, that our country does not provide yet. So thank you, I have to say thank you to end. I took many classes with you. I don't know why you don't have my evaluation printed out. Yeah. <laughs> I took many classes with you, maybe next time. <laughs>